Hey everyone, so my name is Patrick. I'm going to be showcasing the Europa Universalis, the price of power today. Um, what I've got set up is a four player game. Um, me playing as the French, and then we've got three of the bots. Uh, and I wanted to show off some of the bots for this game. Uh, I think they're really quite something. I think they're really cool. Um, so basically, if you want to play by yourself, uh, it is a, you know, it's a one of the six player game. It does have a good solo play variant, um, but you can also mix these in seamlessly. Uh, if you want to do a you know five player game, but you've only got three players, so you can mix into the bots, so you can do certain scenarios like that, um, and then maybe certain scenarios will be set up specifically for solo play with bots. Um, so yeah, the plan here is that we're going to go over kind of the basic mechanics of the game, uh, if you're not familiar with those, and then kind of go over a tutorial on the bot mechanics themselves. Um, they're quite in depth bots. Uh, if you're familiar with certain GMT games, um, there is a certain similar similarity in the that you're doing. Like following these flow charts, um, you know, the, the base flow chart is up here. You know, you can see how it, it's kind of going to bounce around between these separate charts with the, a colonize action, siege, defend, vent. Uh, so you'll be bouncing between all these separate flow charts. You got some specific rules on how they handle events. Um, so you do really have quite a robust system here that is not going to be too predictable for players to plan around. Uh, it does engage with almost every mechanic in the game. So if you're, you know, kind of disappointed by certain games where the bots are really kind of cheating and cutting a lot of the corners, you're not really going to get that with this game, which I think is a great plus to it. Um, so just as an overview on European for South Price of Power, uh, if you're not familiar with it, uh, this game is um, based on Paradox and Directives EU4, or European for South 4. It's a 4x historical game that can be played between 1 to 6 players. Um, and you're going to be taking the reins of one realm um, in Europe or the Middle East, North Africa. Um, and you're going to be taking those through between the periods of 1444 and 1820. Now, not every scenario is going to cover that entire time setting. Uh, you can, of course, play for that entire duration. It's going to take a long time, especially with six players, but I think it's a lot of fun. Or they have a lot more, you know, scenarios that are specific. The one we're playing today is, is a very simple scenario. It just involves the factions of Castile, France, Austria, and England. Um, and it goes for the first two ages of the game. There are four ages. Uh, ages 1 and 2 will cover you from 1444 up until about 1618. Um, and we're going to be saying that we have for some around specific events. So, you know, if we go over the basics of the map here, um, the main board you'll see, you know, it, it has mostly it's about North Africa, Europe, a little bit of the Middle East over here. Um, I'm not sure. I, don't, I think this is technically all Europe here. Um, and then the way that the distant continents are handled here for exploration, it's 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 simplified from the main map, of course. But you see that you, we can go pretty much anywhere we can go in EU4. We can go here. In fact, I'm pretty sure this is just about the entirety of the planet, except maybe you know the poles, <laughs> as in uh, you know North and South Pole, not Poland. Um, you know, the map itself, we've got divided into land and sea zones. Um, you know, the white lines divide the different land areas, and sometimes the lines, lines have little triangles on them. Um, this is to depict mountain passes, which affect movement into hostile areas. The, you know, one of the major institutions of the time period in the video game is the Holy Roman Empire. And we can also see that this is kind of depicted in this discontinuated yellow line. Um, you know, each area on the map is one of these, you know, contained areas in the white borders. Each one of those is comprised of provinces, like these below. You'll see these little province discs are placed on top of provinces. These are provinces without a disc on top of them. Um, if a province has the anchor symbol down here, then that indicates a port or a coastal provinces. That's why you can recruit ships. Or your, sh your ships can go back into harbors. Um, the profit, the capital of a realm on the board. So like Lorraine is the capital of Lorraine. It's a one province. But Bologna is the capital of Burgundy. Um, that's underlined. So every under underlined province is a capital province. Uh, moving on. 
Uh, each area on the map you'll see has a religious um, token. Now, at the start of the game, this is the 1444 map. The back side of this board will be a 1618 map. And on that one, you'll see that this, the owners of the provinces will change and some of the religious starting areas will change. It, it, this, this can change throughout the course of the game. Um, as we'll see, there are tokens over here to indicate something has become Protestant or diverse faith, for instance. But this will show, you know, like Granada or Andalusia starts as diverse faiths. You know, we got Muslim territories in North Africa and Middle East. Um, you know, uh, just some basic rules here, more about areas. Areas are adjacent to, to each other, and you can move between them. If they a, touch each other on land is, is quite simple. Um, but, for instance, a sea zone is only adjacent if, you know, so this area, this land area is adjacent to this land area over the sea because there is a, the, the land areas have a province with a port that connects to the sea, same sea zone, if that makes sense. So, Tripolitania is adjacent to Sicily because they both have ports into the central Mediterranean. Um... So each province on the board, you'll notice that there are smaller ones and bigger ones. So here I'm playing as France. So you notice I got some smaller ones on our smaller cities and then the larger ones here. So on an on, on uncontrolled province, you'll see that there's the large ones and the small ones. So if we zip on over to our player board, we'll see that we have these large disks and small disks. The large ones will give us more tax income and manpower. So this is kind of just to indicate the, you know, more centralized, more industrious, more developed areas of the board. You know, for instance, it makes more sense that Milan is going to give you a lot more than, say, you know, Benghazi. Uh, uh, one of the last things on the map, you'll see that these trade nodes. So trade was kind of, you know, it's a great system in the EU4. A little complicated, uh, I know some people will say. Um, but these trade nodes are represented on the board game as well. Um, and you have inland nodes, um, and you have sea nodes. So, you know, Saxony, Vienna, uh, that's Champagne. These are inland nodes, and you have sea nodes. Um, so these are where you're going to be sending your merchants. This is my merchant here. This is one of my merchants as France, and my other merchant is here. Uh, bots do kind of engage in the trade system, but they don't use merchant tokens. So that's why only I have them down at the moment. Um... You know, the way that you interact with trade is you'll have, you know, if I have my merchant here and I want to trade, I'll draw three cards from the trade deck and then I will read a list of trade nodes uh, and then I'll get the income based on the number of ships I have protecting trade and the number of provinces I have that are on the card. Um, you know, systems like that we'll get into more um, during the playthrough when I interact with them. Uh, we zip on over to the player boards. Um, you know, so we'll see that there are some missing slots here um, on the player board. That's where I placed my provinces on the map from. And then looking at, this is how you track your income in terms of tax and your manpower, is that the greatest rem spot on the right, you will take. You know, if I, if I take this, if I got that on the map, then I can see that I have 10 ducats worth of income on the map and five manpower in large provinces. So if I wanted to tally my income at the end of the round, I say, ah, well, I've got... Eight income and four man power from here, and I've got eight income and four man power from here, so I should have a base tax income of 16 ducats, and my manpower is eight. So you can see that here at the start of the game, France starts with a combined number of eight manpower. Um, yeah. You know, under the, yeah, so under that, we do have the vassal tokens. Vassal tokens, vassals act uh, quite a bit simpler then you might initially think they essentially act as almost the same as a regular province. Um, you know, it's not really an independent province that you have to kind of keep track of in the same way that you do EU4 through diplomacy and whatnot. These essentially act as part of your realm, just with that, you know, you'll see that there are, these are stacked on top of each other. So if I have five provinces of vassals, there's a two there then that's only going to get me three income and three manpower. But if you see the same, if I had five provinces, then that's going to be five income and three manpower. So like in EU4, you're only going to get a portion of the income that your vassals will give you. So 
it can be somewhat easier to vassalize an area on the board and keep control of it than through direct ownership, but you're not going to get as much out of it. Although you do get the same amount of manpower. That's something to keep in mind. Uh, under that, you're going to see that we have the Monarch Power section. Now, Monarch Power is kind of the bread and butter for what we're going to use to take our actions throughout the game. Um, you know, like here's a, the, a simple list of the actions here. We have, you know, under the green, blue, and red sections in the center of the player A, we see administrative actions, diplomatic actions, military actions. These are most of the actions you're going to take throughout the game, and each one of those is going to require that you spend a certain amount of monarch power. So, you know, for instance, if we wanted to forge an alliance with a realm, then we're going to be spending one, two, three, depending on how large the, pro uh, the depending on how large the target nation is from our player board, and we'll simply return that to our, our pool here once it's spent. You get monarch power uh, sometimes through you know, milestones or events, which we'll get to, but generally you're going to be getting the bulk of them at the end of the round step, where you're going to add up the values on your current ruler, as well as any advisors you have. Uh, you'll add those two together. So the advi the administrative one, which we'll get to card draw in a second, but that might say plus two admin at the bottom. So we would get a five admin and then however much of the other three. Uh, yes, yeah, a quick thing on rulers. You know, this is one of these startup setup cards. Um, this is the France 1444 setup. So you're going to grab this one at the start and it'll give you some information on how to set up your faction at the start, as well as giving you a base ruler. Um, the rest of the contents on this ruler down here, Charles VII, is we have the X token on the portrait. That indicates that when an event is resolved that has an X down there in the bottom right by the you know, shattered heart symbol, that we would take a, take a ill health token and we would place that on our little monarch to indicate that he is he is dying slowly. And once you get a second token matching uh, matching your portrait to come up, then then they die, and you will have to replace them or suffer the consequences. Uh, the last part here, the number of dice listed. That means if that we do want to send our ruler in this case as a general in a battle or maybe as an admiral in a sea battle then they will contribute that many dice to the combat uh next to the leader section we have our state religion yep see there as france were catholic um our other realms castile england and austria are all going to be catholic at the start of the game but you know since you know the back side of this has counter reform so we can you know it's, it's a sandbox game, so it, it, we can convert to other religions. Um, you know, it, it would be theoretically possible to maybe try to become Muslim as France. That would be very difficult. <laughs> I don't think that would ever actually happen in real gameplay, but that is something you could mechanically accomplish. Uh, the game is pretty open to just letting you do what you want, and that's very cool. Uh, to the left of this main player mat, we have, well, and some of, we also have an area for our current treasury, which is just coins, which we're going to use for a lot of different actions. Uh, we have our manpower. So our your manpower can either be deployed on the board or in your armies, or it can be kind of in this ready pool when manpower is spent. Like, you know, you got your, say this was over in this army and it got killed, it would move into exhausted. And then at the end step, we would maybe recover some of that. So this is the way to kind of make it so that you, you know, you can only field an army that is manageable by your country. You can't be you know, the size of Genoa and then field a giant army. Just if you're rich enough, you could do it somewhat through mercenaries, but it's not really practical. So in that sense, you know, larger nations will have a larger manpower pool. They will recover manpower quicker. Um, and that's something to keep in mind. Uh, the last thing we have the stability track. Stability is going to get changed. There is an, an administrative action that lets you increase your stability, but mostly it's going to change from events. And these will just kind of give you nice little benefits or drawbacks if you dip down too low. So the plus one is plus two ducats. Um, the plus two allows you to remove some unrest at the end step, and the plus three allows you to gain an extra monarch power of your choice. And then the negative effects of that are kind of just the inverse, where you, you'll lose two ducats at the end step, you'll gain an unrest at the end step, and you'll have to lose a monarch power of your choice at the end step. Now, last, moving on to the left player board, we have, so 
This is how armies are done. You can put, you know, a unit directly onto the board if you so wanted to. This would indicate that we have one infantry unit in the Languedoc section, or more commonly, you're gonna have your your little meeples down here in your army boxes. So army one corresponds to, there's gonna be little pictures um, showing which, which army is which miniature, but army one is this guy up here. So this indicates that we have two infantry and one cavalry over here um, in this section of the game, the Sen region. Uh, and then we'll have the same thing if we had a fleet on the board Say we have it here, you would have you know very similar of ships, and ships have to be light ships, which are good for trade, heavy ships, which are very powerful in combat, but are quite expensive, and galleys, which are only going to be usable in the inland seas areas, but are really dirt cheap compared to the other ships. So you can definitely, you know, it's it's five galleys for the price of every heavy ship. So in you know where the, where the galleys rule the waves, they do so in numbers. Um, yeah, so. As far as how you win the game, <laughs> you the player with the most prestige at the end of the game will win, and prestige is either gained directly um, throughout the game by various actions, like if you force vassalize an, uh, a realm, or if you humiliate another player, or if you complete a mission or a milestone, which we'll get to, that those will all give you prestige. So let's say, you know, it's with the game is just about to end. I'm at 46 prestige here on the, on the prestige track. Then we'll do some base end game scoring where you do get points for how big you are, um, how many, you know, what your stability is, a various number of small effects, and then that'll push me up. I don't, I'll do my final calculation. I'll be up at, you know, I'll be up at 60, or 77, say. Uh, you can that to everybody else. Highest number wins. Um, that's generally how the scenarios will play out. Sometimes you will see some that have specific victory requirements. Uh, but for the most part, it's going to be prestige race. Um, one of the important ways you earn prestige throughout the game is the milestone system. So there are four of these in each deck. So we're going to have... Yes, yeah, so we have four decks of four milestones for each of the four ages. Uh, fours, but so at the start of a game, we'll dish out the age one ones. If we're starting in age one, uh, then we'll draw one of each. Um, in this game, we've have I've, I've just done this randomly. So we have expand nation, have a town in at least two different areas that don't contain any of your core provinces. So a core province for France would be one that has my map that has my token on the board. Um, so I would need to get provinces or town town and provinces are essentially interchangeable. Um, in two areas that I don't have one. So I could take, for instance, Brittany and Normandy. That would be one area. Let's see if I conquered all of this. Doing very well. I conquered all of this. That's one area, so I'd have to get, you know, somewhere else. Let's say I took, I don't know, Corsica for some reason. Um, no offense to Corsica. But that would complete that milestone for me. I would then score five um, prestige if I'm the first player to do so, and I would get two diplomatic cubes. So... You know, and looking at the other three, there are these kind of... These will be for the whole age, which is four rounds. So you do have kind of a while to score these, but bear in mind that, you know, after the first three players, you don't even get any prestige for completing them afterwards. So there is kind of this race to complete the milestones at the start of each age. Um, you know, sometimes, yeah, you can get unlucky. There are some, you know, that directly... Uh, interact with colonization or exploration. Um, so if you're playing Poland and you know there's something coming up about discovering other continents and exploration, that's that's not going to be great for you. But you know there are a lot of others that are going to be pretty hard for colonizers to do. You know, like England is definitely going to have trouble with some of these. Um, Poland is going to have a great time with some of these. Uh, so there is kind of this give and take in in what milestones come up for you. Um, but, you know, that's all kind of part of the balance in, in the discussion of the above board game is you say, oh, well, you know, um, hey, you guys, you know, oh, wow, these milestones work so well for France. And then, and, um, you know, you use that to downplay your own position and to kind of creep up. And But, you know, for the most part, these are, you know, like in this one, for instance, these are really pretty broad. Um, anybody can complete these. You know, if there's someone that has like some nice events early on that give them some stability, or one that gives them a royal marriage token, that'll crown with the rings underneath is a royal marriage. 
then you're gonna get some advantage on those. The other main way you get milestones on cards is through the mission system. Now the mission system is right about to get a pretty big uh, update, so don't get like too too critical on what these missions are. But these are kind of inspired by a lot of the EU4 mission trees. So these green ones being starter missions, you can think of as the root node of a tree. So I've chosen two of the French starter missions down here. Uh, we have Reconquer Normandy and Reconquer Gascony. So this one says I need to control or vassalize Normandy and Co. This one is Bordeaux and Maine, which would be these two provinces of England and these other two provinces that belong to England. So yeah, as, uh, <laughs> my mission selection here is definitely forecast that I'm going to be trying to fight with England. Uh, these are secret. They would be in your hand. Uh, I'm just taking them out for clarity. So that is part of the game, you know, like what missions do I want to take? What do I want to do? Um, yeah. Now the round, this, okay, so going into more of the structure of the game, the game has um, four ages, as I said, each age is broken into four rounds, and then each round is conducted as a, you know, round robin where, well, not really round robin, but each each player, starting with whoever has the first player token, takes one turn, and then the next player takes a turn, 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 until a certain number of players have passed, depending on the player count, um, and at that point the game, the round goes into kind of a cleanup stage, and then we go on to the next round. Um, now each round has four phases. In the first phase, uh, we put out some events. Uh, it's kind of the draw cards phase. If we go right over here, the draw cards cards. We're gonna draw, reveal the event cards. We're gonna draw action cards. We're gonna pay to keep however many we want, and then we'll draw and replace our missions. Now the first age or the first round of the game is a little different, um, and we're actually just gonna conduct it here. This is a this game is perfectly set up to start off. So at the start of the game, each player is going to draw one of each type of action card. So I think that should get us one of each, okay? And then we have the choice of drawing three more, and that can be of any combination of the three base action card types we want. And then those are administrative cards, diplomatic cards, and military cards. So at this point, you know, you really got to think of what you want to do. Um, and you got to keep in mind, well, depending on how much you personally value, uh, advisors or what monarch power or what so there's a lot of strategy right off the bat on what you want to do a lot of planning ahead um, so me thinking about this right now I see that we have three advisors which is not not all of these cards have advisors on them but we've drawn three advisors that are plus two plus one and plus two so that would give us in total if we played these plus five plus two and plus five at the end round so that's quite good a lot of yes a lot of administrative and a lot of military potential i don't think we're going to be using the naval maneuver for its action since i think we're going to be focused mostly on the land for the foreseeable future so we would use this as our advisor and we would probably use this as an advisor i think we want to use this as an action so we are going to draw another diplomatic card and hopefully get a diplomatic advisor we did not we got safe technology is okay and then we're actually gonna draw two military cards because I foresee conflict with England interesting interesting okay now yeah so now we're gonna pay to assign these guys so to assign an advisor you play it right from our hand since I the, the bots don't perf interact with the cards so I'm just gonna go ahead and do it all for me right now we're gonna play Thomas here as an advisor, and we're going to play Stephen here as an advisor. We're going to hang on to this one. I think I'd rather have the subjugate action card over the plus one advisor. So you see here that this guy costs two, this guy costs two, so in total they cost four. So we're going to kill off four of our coins here. We've spent four to hire our two advisors. Okay. Um, so that's really the main difference in the first round, is that normally... The way it works is we're going to draw three action cards um, of our choice and we can draw those sequentially so we can look at the first one see what it is see if we like it or not then make the second draw and then make the third draw uh, and then you're going to pay two coins two ducats for each one of those you want to keep um, and then you're going to discard the rest 
Uh, and then technically after after we've done this step, we would draw missions. I've gone ahead and done it now because I think this is what we would want to do anyway. Um, yeah. The second phase after this, after everyone has kind of done this, we go into the action phase. Um, and since we're doing a four person game, you can see down here at the very bottom of the left of the screen, reward for passing. It says number of players four plus. So the first to pass gets five ducats, the second to pass three, the third to pass two. Um, so in, in this scenario, once three players have passed, uh, the last player is kind of under a, a very short clock to finish out anything that he has to do mandatory, which is taking an event um, and then the round will end. Uh, after the action phase, which is generally the longest phase, we go to the Peace and Rebels phase. Uh, here you deal with the outcome of the wars and the effects of rebels in your provinces. Uh, Non-player realms, you know, anything that's not one of the four factions we're playing as. Um, you know, at war with, you know, non-player realms that we're at war with and that we've not taken some territories for us might invade us. That's the invasion step. Um, rebels will try to conquer provinces and rest. Uh, then we can have our peace conferences to try to resolve any wars we're in. Uh, we'll add maybe religious dissent, which is unrest in provinces with a different religion than us. Um, so that's why the religion on the map is important because if we're, you know, a Catholic realm, but we control, you know, a, a host of Muslim provinces, we're going to have to deal with a lot of unrest at the end of the round. Um, and then finally, for each province in unrest, we're going to roll one of these rebel dice. And then we'll take the results. You know, for instance, this roll got us lose a monarch power cube. Um, so we would have to lose one of these of our choice, which would be a bummer. Uh, finally, the last round is the income and upkeep phase. Um, so at that point, we get a chance to fire any advisors or dismiss married to units and recall ships to sea. When a ship is at s in a port, you don't pay upkeep for it. So that way, if we kind of notice the going into the income upkeep phase, that hold on. Uh, I'm on the brink of bankruptcy here. We kind of have a chance to fix some problems here in our economy. Uh, then you're just going to collect uh, your income. You're going to tally up how much you get from your provinces, uh, your vassal provinces, any effects like stability, the plus two. There are some other rules that might get you a couple ducats. And then we'll subtract upkeep for our military units, you know, one for each deployed land unit, uh, one for every two ships deployed at sea, rounding up. Uh, upkeep for advisors, um, yeah, for stability, and then we'll kind of get at the end of that um, money based on what we have left over. Maybe maybe we might lose money on the upkeep. Maybe you know in total, maybe we'll get some money. No, either way, um, and then we're gonna collect the monarch power. So for us, if everything goes, if this makes it to the end of the round, then we'll have you know we'll, we'll gain five, one, and five monarch power. So not very diplomatic. Uh, which we'll have to deal with. Um, and then we're going to update our manpower. We'll recover half rounded up of our manpower uh, to a minimum of two. So that way, if you know, you're know you a huge nation and you've, you know, you've got 18 manpower, you lose a ton of it in a battle. Um, you know, Say you've got 10 exhausted manpower, we're going to recover five of that at the end of the round. Uh, and then if our hand size has gotten... You know, above five, then we do have to discard some of those. That shouldn't happen a ton unless you're doing some some weird shenanigans here. Um, you know, I want to go over some of the actions a little bit first before we chop into the game, just to give you some idea. Uh, the event action. Um, so, one of the driving forces for action on the board is the event system. So, you build the event deck at the start of the game. Uh, the scenario will tell you what to put in there. Um, you're going to have faction or realm specific events for each player. You're going to have two of those per age, and then those will be divided into two halves. So you can get both of the Castine events in the first two rounds. They have to get split up. So this is a, a first half event. These are all going to be first half events. This is a wild, so that can be neither half. But, you know, that way the things are going to happen sequentially. So you couldn't have, I don't know, say. The Protestant Revolution couldn't happen before the Protestant League, for instance. That wouldn't really make any sense. Or the Protestant Reformation, not a revolution. Um, yeah, so when you take an event, let's say I'm France, I want to take the Hungarian throne. I can take someone else's event, um, and then I would get to choose A or B here. Because say, oh, I want Austria to lose a prestige, but they can add two influence tokens 
two Hungarian areas, and I would gain two diplomatic mono power. Uh, and then when I do take an event, say there's two face down here. So if I take, if I were to take the Hungarian throne, I would flip the next one in the pile. And then what I would also do is I would put two ducats on any existing event uh, that was there before I flipped it. So that way, if there is something bad, so you might look at revolts, for instance, and say, "Well, I have to choose my own areas and add unrest to it." You know, like, why would I ever do that? So the question, you know, the point is that eventually these these kind of worse ones are going to have ducats on them and they're going to have money on them. So, well, you know, yes, maybe I'll have to take events, you know, revolts later on, but maybe there's going to be like six or eight ducats on there and that's that's actually not a bad trade. Uh, I haven't actually seen this one and I didn't know what that is, so I'll try to forget that I know what's under there. Uh, the next of the special... I'm doing the special actions up here in the middle column. Player-to-player -player diplomacy... That's when you can kind of make trades and deals with the other players at the board. Say, you know, maybe enter into an official mechanical alliance or royal marriage. Or you know, want to sell prophecies to one another. You can do all those things. Uh, research ideas is the next one. It says cost it on the cart. So if I wanted to research cannons, for instance, or request for the new one, I would pay five diplomatic power or five military power here. And then these do a whole host of things. These are randomly drawn at the start of the game, except for these three, which are fixed. Um, you know, for instance, the quest for the new worlds. When we take it, we can now perform the explore action, and I would gain one mana power of my choice to put back, which leads very well into the explore action down below those two. So the explore action is how I kind of, you know, if I was England here, I could take the explore action and maybe move. From the Eastern Atlantic, we see the B symbol. That would allow me to move to any sea zone with the B on it. So I could go over here to the Caribbean Sea. And then I could start exploring the new continent. Uh, you know, there's a lot of money on trade to be made over in North America, South America. There's these gold provinces down here where you're going to get a lot of money. So it can be very nice to explore. Uh, else in the basic actions, we have change state religion. Not an action you typically see a whole bunch um generally if you're flipping a religion your religion is going to be due to certain events um you know like the active supremacy in england uh you're going to see that that flip your religion it can be a little expensive to voluntarily change your religion in terms of prestige you can certainly do it um, you know, if you notice that uh well you know protestantism is spread way faster in france than i expected they would so maybe we might we might flip over to be state religion Protestant if we see that that might be causing us some issues if we don't. Uh, then the last special action is change national focus. So that will allow us to kind of move some monarch power around. Uh, the way that works is you have to choose one area of your monarch power. You're going to choose to add two to that from the other monarch power areas. So if I choose military, if I choose fo change national focus to military, I have to take one from diplomacy and one from administrative. Um, and those those have to come out of one of each. Um, so if you have no diplomatic power but four administrative power, you can't do it. Um, should have planned out your turn better. Uh, free actions, these are things you can actually do at any point. You can do it during someone else's turn. Um, you can take or repay a loan. So a loan token, I would grab one of these guys over here, I'd put that in my treasury. And I would gain five ducats, but it takes six to repay. Um, loans, you know, <laughs> uh, loans to anyone who's played E4, they're good, essentially. You know, don't be afraid to take on debt. There's a reason <laughs> why it was done a lot historically. Uh, you know, if you're, you know, you're low on ducats, you only got five in your income, and all of a sudden, you know, Castile, you're... Your friend who you thought was your buddy all games declared a surprise war on you. You know, uh, maybe worth loaning up. Maybe taking three or four loans. Maybe even five. Five is the max to kind of throw together an army as quickly as you can. But you have to watch out. Not only do they take one more to pay off, but each loan that you have outstanding at the end of a round will cost you one in upkeep. Um, and tragically, if you have five loans and you are forced to pay a cost that you cannot pay since you have no more money and you can't take any more loans, you'll go bankrupt. Um, bankruptcy is pretty bad. 
Um, you'll lose a ton of monarch power, you'll lose some stability, you'll lose some prestige. So it, it can't be a fine line to walk between how much loan do I take um, and how much do I risk bankruptcy. Uh, the next one is replenish manpower. You can spend one military power per two units. I think that's been changed to three units now. So if I, I'm up against the wall, uh, I'm really getting pushed in. Um, but I do have a surplus of military power. I can spend that to kind of pull back some of my manpower so I can recruit it. And that's a free action. So what that kind of means is that you can do a recruitment. Um, so I pay one to do a recruit. And then if I notice that, oh, well, I don't actually have as much military power as I want, or I don't have as much manpower, you can kind of bump up the cost of that recruitment by putting in, you know, maybe I plan, maybe I spend three, all three of mine to do a recruitment plus replenishing six manpower. Um, yeah, and then free, last free action, hire or recruit, hire advisor or recruit leader. Hiring advisors would be kind of the start, um, or recruiting a leader would be similar, but see at the bottom of this guy we would recruit gareth as a general for army one um so we would put him under army one he is going to add two cavalry dice to any battle involving army one uh the way the dice work is let's say we're doing a battle we get three of these white dice by default and then so we had gareth in there so we get two cavalry dice as well we're gonna roll these up oops that was a weird roll we have you know, a, a double infantry symbol here, which is only relevant in a certain idea, but it's an infantry symbol, two cavalry symbols, and an artillery symbol. So we would look at our army, and we would see that we only have two infantry and a cavalry. So we can match up this with one of our infantry. Actually, I can't. Yeah. And then we can match up this with one of our cavalry. We can't match up a second cavalry because we only have one cavalry and we have no artillery. And this is a miss. So we would only have done two hits here. Um, whereas if maybe if we had, you know, if we had, if we had some more cavalry or some more artillery mix in here, you would get more hits. And then there are a lot of effects, um, that can get you more dice in the battle. Better general can get you more dice. Uh, certain military ideas can get you more dice. Certain action cards you play from your hand can get you more dice. Um, so there's a lot more to, you know, the dice roll than it's, it's not just you know, in something you might say, like, here I stand, which just mass dice rolls. It's all one type of unit. You're just trying to get as many hits as possible. There is a lot more thinking going into what dice I want to put in, how I want to craft the composition of my army, um, you know, what leader I want. There's a lot of decision making that can go into making a better army. If you just spam 20 infantry without a, with a, you know, a, a poor general, and then you send them into someone who's got, you know, a couple military dice, maybe some uh, maybe some military reform card active. He's got his balance spread, and he's got a good general. You're gonna get you're gonna get munched. So that's definitely something you gotta keep in mind. Um, yes, yeah, so the administrative actions increase stability. You're gonna pay flat cost. I, that says six AP. I believe that was brought down to five AP in a recent change. Um, so you can increase this manually if you want without any kind of card or any kind of event. That one's pretty straightforward. Convert area, you're gonna pay three action points and three ducats. I believe that was also changed to two action points and three ducats. So if I control, if I control every province in a region, then that would allow me to change the religion of that area. I pay the cost. I do have to mark one of those regions is not rest as they kind of re resist the religious conversion. Um, now, yeah, so I said you have to control every area, every province, it's not quite like that. You have to control, you have to either control every province or you have to control every province except provinces that are controlled by realms that are the same religion as you. So let's say, for instance, I control these three provinces and Castile can control this province. Even though I don't control the whole area, the last province that I don't control is controlled by another Catholic power. And since I'm trying to convert to Catholic, uh, you're, 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 you're able to. Um... Uh, below that we have colonized, so we do have discoveries on the board. Maybe we've maybe we've d discovered Angola here as the French. Um, I can spend a certain number of colonists that would be in this colonist pool. You get those at the end of the round, and I would convert that claim or that exploration into a province. Oh, actually that was the wrong bag. Um, that's how you that's how you turn your discoveries into land essentially. 
Uh, heading down now to the diplomatic actions, we can do influence for one diplomatic power or three ducats per token. So you'll notice that like as France, I've got two cubes on the map here in Languedoc, one in Lombardy, one in Burgundy, you know, England has some here. Influence on the board is kind of a measure of how much, well, I want to say influence that you have in an area. Um, it's required to take certain actions like vassalizing, annexing realms, forging alliances somewhere. Um, you can also use it for military access for areas that are, are neutral to you. Um, you know, or if, if you're playing in the Holy Roman Empire, it's it's the main determiner in who's going to win an imperial election when the emperor dies. It's, you know, whoever has the most influence in each of these elector areas. You'll thumb that up and see who has the most votes and emperor breaks ties. Um, so influence is, is, is very important. Um, yeah, and so that, to place them, you can either place them directly on the board, if you think about it, as you're spending one DP per token you place, you could, instead of just putting them in the bag and then putting them in there, you could just put them straight on the board area somewhere. Or you can spend three ducats, three ducats or three coins, to place one directly. And you can do, you know, we, we're not limited to one here, so I could spend 12 ducats and two diplomatic power from my board and I'd be able to place six. Uh, the only restrictions on it are you can only place two at a time per area and there can only be a total of five influence tokens in an area in total. Um, so that way you avoid things like, you know, all of a sudden I just dump, you know, five influence into S Switzerland and no one else can play any influence there without doing some shenanigans or, you know, a surprise election where I put, you know, three in Bren three into Brandenburg, three into Saxony, and three into Westphalia all at the same time and they beat Austria just because, you know, I put too much in at once. Uh, we can do a Forge Alliance. Forge Alliances with NPRs is very handy. As France, we start with one with, with Provence. That's going to allow us to kind of call on some aid from them during wars. Um, it paves the way for vassalization. We're going to spend diplomatic power equal to half rounded up of their tax income. So let's say we wanted to ally with Milan. Um, there are two things we have to keep in mind. A, to forge an alliance with someone, we have to have two influence there already. We don't have that, so we would have to take an influence action to put one more cube here. So let's say we did that. I'll copy and paste that one. We'll remove that in a second. And then after that, they have a tax income of one, two for the big one three and then four so half of that is two so we would have to spend two diplomatic power to then forge an alliance with them so let's delete this one so we take one of our alliance tokens and we would put it on milan and then there's a bonus for forging an alliance there we would get to add a an influence in that area as well so if we did that we would actually end up with five influence this this area we max out influence we'd have an alliance with milan and we'd have three influence in that area um, next, we can fabricate a claim as France. We should have two claims on the board already. Yeah, we have one in Aquitaine and one in Brittany and Normandy. Um, so claims are going to be useful for a couple things. One, it gives us a Casus Belli. You do have to have a cause for war uh, in this game. You can go in no CB. Don't recommend it. <laughs> it's very easy to get a claim. You just spend the 2 DP. Um, it's not really worth... The, the no CB. I don't think it is in EU4 either, but I see some people do it. Um, so what that's gonna, that's gonna give you a cost for war, so you can go in. Um, it's also when you, in the peace and rebels phase, or when you resolve the peace, if I have a claim in Aquitaine and I've taken Bordeaux, for instance, that would allow me to, normally when you take an area in a war, you're gonna get it in unrest, in an unrest state. If I have a claim, I can kind of burn the claim to remove two provinces in unrest. Um, so, you know, if I, if I took one, two, three, f well, not Anjou, because they're my ally, but I took these three. If I didn't have claims, I'd be stuck with that unrest at the end of the round, which could be frustrating depending on the results. But if I have claims there, I can just burn the claims off and I get to remove that for free. So that's very nice. Um, trade. So I mentioned trade earlier. We'll get into trade when I take the trade action. I'm certainly going to. Um, but essentially that is how you, you don't get trade like you do with tax income at the end of the round. You only get it actively through taking the trade action. 
where you draw three cards, you're going to choose one, you're going to activate a node, and based on the merchant and everything on the card, you're going to get some money. Uh, moving on to the military actions, it's you have declare war, so I could declare war on England, I could cite my Casus Belli. Now we're at war, we're going to take our little war symbols, put them over each other, just so we can keep track of it. Uh, the, yeah, the declare war action itself, uh, if there are armies in the same area, that'll trigger a battle with them. If there's no battle, then I get to do a free activation as part of it. You know, kind of a surprise attack. Um, activate an army or fleet. That's how you move things around or conduct a siege. You you pay to activate an army, and then you can take actions with that army, be it movement or, um, you know, activating a fleet to, to move your ships around. Um... Recruit, which I mentioned a little bit earlier. Uh, you're going to spend one MP, and then you're going to be able to recruit from your manpower pool or from kind of like a base mercenary pool, which everyone can pull from. So I would say I want to spend uh, you know two ducats per infantry, five for cavalry, six for artillery if you've got them unlocked. So I would say oh, I'll build a two infantry for four, and then the cavalry for five. So it's nine. Then to spend nine um, to afford those guys. And then you have to pay from either your treasury. You can take loans, as I mentioned earlier. Five for each loan. Um, and that's it. That's all, Those are all the actions. Um, you know, that was kind of a quick overview of them. Because, you know, we're going to go into a demo play here. So we can, we'll go into them more as they come up. Um, yeah. So the next thing I want to talk about is the bots and how the bots work. So, I did talk to them a little bit earlier, but the so we've got a couple options in here where we build their deck. So I'll go over to each bot. So these will be on a little play sheet that you'll be able to pull out. But I pulled out different copy tablets so I can show them all at the same time. So the first thing you do is you kind of build their deck using you know the bot deck here. Like this is the Castilian deck. We're gonna we'll shuffle this afterwards, so we're not cheating. But, you know, you'll see each of these cards have certain actions on them, like take an idea, we're going to go to the diplomacy chart, the military chart, papal curia, the, you know, the pope, another diplomacy one, convert a religion or focus economic. So you'll build those decks based on each age and their specific chart. This is the Castile chart. Um... So that way, you know, if you're if you're doing Poland, it doesn't make sense to use the whole deck because the whole deck contains things like exploration, naval exploration. You don't really want that in there as much as somebody like Castile, who you do want to be taking those actions. And then you're gonna have these targeting charts for their military or diplomatic actions. So if we draw, say, diplomacy, and you know we need to choose a target, then that's that's specific for each realm. So we'll roll a dice, um, papal state. For instance, on a 1, if Papal State is invalid for whatever reason, maybe we're trying to forge an alliance, but we already have an alliance with Papal State, or someone has rudely destroyed the Papal State, then from there we'll kind of roll again um, into either Venice or Milan, or maybe we more likely we hit Aragon, because it's on a 2, 3, or 4, or 5, uh, indicating that, you know, <clears throat> Castile wants to kind of perform the Iberian wedding and union and vassalize and and next, uh, Aragon. Uh, so yeah, you're gonna do, yeah, the, each the, each of the bots have their own deck compositions and flow charts for diplomacy and military. Um, you know, they have a couple rules on how they handle unrest. This is the, you know, the whole document here. You've got a lot of different charts. <clears throat> so you're not really having to do the whole Choose whatever you think is best for the bot um, extrapolation. That you can generally just follow this. It's going to tell you exactly what to do. And the charts are really well put together for the spy instance. For spy, you know, are we at war with somebody? The red arrow is no, yes. Green is yes. Uh, if we're not, an opponent is like another player or bot. So the areas of the game where the bot doesn't really interact with is pretty limited they don't interact with treasury they don't have coins um they kind of have their own you can see their, their sheet here is actually is quite simple they have bot power uh instead of each of the three separate monarch powers um so 
you know, their 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 monarch power is is condensed into one category, so it's it's kind of easier for them to manage. Um, they do have manpower. They do have the army that they need to move around. Um, they do interact with religion. They do interact with the milestones and the missions and the events. Um, their battles use the same dice system, albeit with a few caveats. Uh, they don't have to draw generals. They'll always draw. So, you know, they interact with the Papal Curia. They interact with the Hilarion Empire. They, they have to pass. They have to score prestige. Um, they explore. They really do everything that a player does for the most part, except for, as I said, they don't do action cards and they don't really do money. But they have other restrictions on them that make it a little trickier for them. Um, so I think from this, we'll actually just dive into play. So you can, I can kind of explain it as we go. We'll actually pull these missions into our hand here. Um, in this scenario, I'm the French player. Uh, France is just defined as the first player for this scenario. So I'm going to take the first turn here. So, I don't know, what the fuck to think about what we're going to do here. <laughs> Looking at the events, you know, we can kind of walk through these events if we want to take any of these. As the French player, I know that my event in the first half of the first age, so it could be this round, it could be one of these two. Actually, well, technically I do know it's not this one, although I shouldn't know that. Uh, it could be this one, or it could be next round. It has to do with the Italian Wars. It's not super critical, you know, sometimes there's like an event like the Iberian Wedding, where the top action is really great for Castile, the bottom one is not so much. It's not bad, but it's, it, it, well, it is kind of bad, but it's more that you miss out on the top one. Um, but, so we're not super fussed about getting our events, so it might be worth you know, if we go to the Hungarian throne, this Hungarian, this Austrian mission, we see it on the B option, that would give us two diplomatic power, which would be handy because we're not going to be getting much diplomatic power. Hmm, what are we going to do here? I think the first thing we'll do, oh yeah, we should actually, the first thing we should do actually look okay, at is the rest of the milestones to see if there's anything that we can score here quickly. Uh, this one we can score quickly. That one's actually going to be quite tough for us in general. We can take a promises in Brittany and Normandy, but after that, it's actually going to get a little tricky for us because we'll have to go into if we if we can get into Aragon. Aragon's quite strong, and then everything to our east is in the Holy Roman Empire or is Burgundy, which is quite strong. Um, you know, these areas we already have a town here, so we can't go into it and. Fighting into the HRE can be tough. So that one's, this one's gonna be tricky for us unless we go overseas with the exploration. Uh, dynastic ties have two royal marriage tokens in play and at least four influence in each realm. And each, at least one of those royal marriages must be with one we didn't start with. We didn't start with any. So I wonder if we'd want to go for that one. But again, you can only form a royal marriage with a specific royal marriage card, which we have been drawn to start with. So that one also might be quite tough for us. Conquer enemy lands. Now this one we could do. So successfully siege two or more provinces on the same turn. So when I take the siege action, when I activate this army, and I take a siege action, I can spend one military power for each. Uh, and then that act, yeah, I can spend one military power for each unit I want to activate in that army to siege with. So this is actually, this army here, this only has one infantry in it. So, but let's say this had, you know, five infantry. I could spend two military power to activate two infantry. And that would give me a seed strength of two, which would allow me to take one of these big provinces. They're worth two, small ones are worth one. Uh, infantry are worth one siege power. Cavalry are worth half a siege power. So you really don't want to be sieging with cavalry. And then artillery are worth two siege power. So you're going to get a lot more efficiency out of your actions if you can get cannons to siege with. So I'm, I am eyeballing Normandy here. That would allow us to score the milestone quite easily. Uh, bots do score milestones. They do them a little differently, but they do interact with the milestones. So I wonder if we want to build up to try to rush down Normandy. The last one, have a stability of plus two or higher. That one we can't really do. Um, that one's going to be tough for us. You know, if we were Spain, for instance, though, we see that the B option here gives us one stability. So Spain... If we were Spain, we could theoretically go for that one in the first round. We can maybe focus on administrative, get the administrative power. We need to increase our stability manually, and then take the event. 
and that would give us up to plus two. So I think what we're going to do, just to get the ball rolling, is I'm going to take a trade action, just to kind of showcase that out. So what we're going to do is we're going to draw three trade cards from the deck. I'm pretty sure that shuffled. And we're going to look at our options here. We have that cloth one, which I think we're actually going to take. So we have three options. We feel the first one up here, Spices. Um, and those are activate the nodes of the East Indies, the Indian Ocean, or Alexandria. As France, we do not have access to any of those three at the moment. So we can pretty much ignore this one for now. Uh, the Iron, we see Bordeaux. Yes, we do have a merchant there already. We have a ship adjacent to it. Baltic Sea, no. Astrakhan, no. We don't really have access to that one. Or, we actually got pretty lucky to get two choices here. We have Champagne, which here, again, we also have our merchant in. I did not sack the deck, I promise. Uh, but it's, it's quite lucky that we've gotten two of these here. Um, so we have two options between these two. And the way you kind of figure out what you would earn is you look at say Bordeaux. So if, if we wanted to activate Bordeaux, we would get one trade power for having a merchant in the node. We would get one trade power for each light ship in a trade slot. Oops, sorry. Uh, adjacent to that node. So we have one. So we're up to two trade power. Then we would look at the key provinces and we would tally up which ones we control. We don't have Bordeaux yet. Do we have Bourbon? We do have Bourbon. We don't have Navarra. And we don't have knots, I believe. So we would look up here, we say, this is the trade power row. So three to five, this is a undeveloped, the green is the undeveloped trade node, the red is the developed trade node. There's an action card that lets us permanently, basically improve a node for everybody that uses it. So we would see that three gets us 10 ducats here. And then if we want to compare that to Champagne, we would count up again, we have one for having the merchant in the node. And then Champagne, we do control. And there's a little plus symbol here. A lot of the inland trade nodes, since you can't get bonuses for ships, um, you have the plus. That indicates that it's worth an extra trade power. So Champagne would be worth one normally, but the plus indicates that it's worth two. So with the merchant, we're up to three already. Burgundia, we don't control. Lorraine, we don't control. Geneva, we don't control. So again, we're at three. Uh, and again, that gets us 10. So th these are going to be identical for us based on which one we choose. But one thing to keep in mind is that when we take a trade action, the normally when you take a trade action with other players in the game, um, I activate that whole node itself. I'm not activating my merchant there. Uh, specifically, I'm activating that node. So other players that have their merchant in that node would also be able to benefit this, from the card at the same time. So that way, you have if you have like a high importance trade node uh, in the game with like Portugal, Castile, France, England, and uh, the Netherlands, and everyone is kind of up in North America, jostling for trade power um, in those trade nodes. Those are going to be up a lot of money because they're going to be getting activated a lot. As opposed to something, you know, like a Aleppo, where maybe just the Ottoman players can be trading. It's not going to get you as much. But as a bot, as consideration against a bot, if I take a trade action and I take a select a maritime node, so the C1, uh, they would gain one bot power per ship or two on a distant continent they have adjacent, or uh, on a land node, they'll gain one for each if they have at least one town adjacent to the selected node. Hmm. So do they? Uh, so yes, yeah, so we kind of have a choice. But if I do Bordeaux, I'm actually giving out quite a lot of bot power here because I give out two to England because I have one here, one here, and I give one over to Castile. But if I did Champagne, then since Austria is adjacent, they'll get one. So we're gonna do Champagne. And we'll just, we're just gonna flip over one merchant here to indicate that he's been activated. So you can only use a merchant uh, once per round. He'll refresh. We're gonna get our 10 ducats. I'm just gonna copy and paste the fiver. And then Austria is actually gonna get a bot power for that because we gave it to him. Now, you know, if this was a person, then I could uh, be like, hey, you know, I helped you out with some trade. Maybe you'll help me out later with some trade. Uh, but, you know, since the, the bot does not have feelings, we cannot, you know. 
We can't call to him. So next we're gonna jump over. Is that that was our turn? That was one action. We got one action. We did, we did pretty well actually. Ten ducats for a single trade action. That was pretty lucky. Um, but now we're gonna go with Castile. So what Castile will do is we will. I probably shouldn't put that all over there. Um, going over to the bot chart here just so I can kind of show you it. Um, we're gonna. So they started out. Do they have that little bender from Futurama looking symbol is the bot power? So do they have zero bot power or if the end of action phase trigger is met? The end of action phase trigger is when, you know, the, the certain number of players is when three players have passed. Then that, that kind of gives them the clock that they have to work with. So that is not the case. Are they under attack? Are there enemies in their own realm? No, they're not. Uh, is there an army on the map board and can it siege in the same area? No. Uh, their army is not on the map board. It doesn't start on the map board for the bots, uh, so it can't see each in the same area. Do they have two colonists, a colonial claim, and three bot power left? No, they don't have colonists or a colonial claim. Is their spent bot power greater than the bot power they have remaining? No, they have nine unspent, zero spent. Do they have any bot action cards left? Yes, they do. The bot action cards are here. Uh, this is the deck that we built for them. So they are going to head and draw one of those cards. So we're gonna flip over the first one here, and we have a military action. So first thing first, we're gonna we're gonna spend that corresponding one bot power, and then we're gonna go over here. Actually, I'm gonna move this closer to the bots. I think that makes a bit more sense. So we're gonna scroll down until we get to the military action here. So military action, here we go. So they're gonna go through here. They're gonna say, are they at war? No. Do they have a claim somewhere? Do they have a claim somewhere? They do, they have one in Granada. Um, so one thing that is outdated here, these claims basically should have a number on them, one through six. So we're actually gonna we'll do a little, uh, yeah, little, little ad hoc change here. We're gonna add, add a one to this claim. And you'll have six of them, so you can just number them one through six. Or maybe you have a eight, I'm not sure. That's not important. But we're gonna, so we have a claim, yes. So we're gonna roll our, our dice here. Oh, we got a six. So we would check to see if that matches uh, one of the claims on the board. So we don't always know. It's good to have unpredictability in, in where the vault will go, otherwise the players can kind of plan around it too much. So does roll match number on a claim? No, it does not. Crusade call on the adjacent realm and bot is Catholic? Nope, there are no crusades call, although we are Catholic. So we're gonna go to our military target chart just what we kind of showed off earlier. Scrolling up here. Uh, if we look at this, so we see that if we roll a one or a two, we're gonna look at Navarra, three through five, Granada, and a six, Portugal. Portugal would be kind of crazy because uh, the English are allied with there. So if uh, that happens, France will be very happy. Um, all right, that didn't roll very well. I don't really like tabletop smooth that is rolling. I would love for them to roll a six, but that, that roll looks suspicious to me so we're gonna roll that again okay they got it too that makes a lot more sense so one or two goes to navara so they're gonna look at navara now uh target is an opponent yeah again opponent is another bot or a player so that's not the case truce or allied with the target no uh their army is larger than target strength so right now their army starts at a measly two guys they can recruit quite a bit more than that but castell only starts with two uh and navara's strength is just one they only have one small province. So even though their army is two, they actually fulfill that. Um, yeah, so it's two, it's bigger than one, yes. So they jump down to the declare war on target. Uh, remove influence and gain spot power for alliances as normal for declaration of war. Um, so yeah, wow, this is interesting. So they're gonna go ahead and declare war on Navarra. Uh, they do actually lose influence in areas that the bot is uh, that the target is in, so they're gonna lose some influence from the Aragon area. It's a shame they didn't force an alliance before going in. Uh, then you would gain bot, they would gain bot power in this case, bot power or military power um, for when you call an ally into war where they're adjacent or in the same area. So they would gain one if they're allied with the Aragon here, but they're not, they don't have any allies, so they're not gonna get anything there. Uh, okay, so we've, we've declared war. Then we continue on that black arrow out to the left. Triggers land or naval battle. So, 
This would happen if Castile had any ships adjacent to ports controlled by Navarre for a naval battle, or if they had any land units in land areas where Navarre had provinces. That is not the case. So again, continuing on. Uh, triggers land naval battle, no. Army can siege in its current area. Again, their army doesn't start deployed, so no. Can reach enemy army or area in one activation. Now this one, when you determine what a bot can reach and their map isn't on the board, they can basically start out in any area where they control provinces. So in this case, we could start out in Castile. Now, can this army reach Aragon from Castile, for instance? Yes, it can. Um, an army can move two spaces, but has to stop when you enter a neutral or hostile area. So how that plays out in practice is if we were in, you know, Andalusia, we could, well, it's this, the mountain kind of here complicates things, but we could cross it with one two guys. So we can move once here. We don't stop because this is a friendly area and then we can continue to move into Aragon as such. So we have now moved into a hostile area. This is going to be the first battle already here. Um, so bot battles against NPRs are pretty quick and dirty just to kind of, you know, it's not really fun to just sit there for a while resolving battles between a bot and, you know, a, a, a bot light edition essentially. So all you do for a bot battle against an NPR is you roll a number of infantry dice equal to, uh, basically the, the, the bots, the NPR strength in that area. So for Navarra, that's only one. They just have Navarra itself. Uh, Navarra has the attacks, you know, military power of one. It's half the tax income, but rounded up. So one divided by two point five rounded up is one. So we just roll one infantry dice here, and on anything but a miss, they would score a hit. So Castile would lose their one guy. Of their two, it's going to go over here. There is going to be a section for manpower on the on a new edition of the board. So they lost one guy. Uh, since their army is still alive, the bot council is now having won the battle. They must have killed one of the guys there. When you win a battle on your turn, you gain one military power. The bot gains one bot power. So they basically recoup their cost here. Um, then you'll see, can reach enemy army in one activation? Yes. Uh, move it, move to do it, essentially. Uh, triggers a land battle. Yes, we did the land battle. If victorious, gain one bot power. Then the end turn. So that's their turn. That was the Castilian turn. Uh, pretty aggressive right off the bat. Declaration of War turn one on Navarra. That's an interesting move. Uh, it does mean that this now area, if they take it, this area would be under their control. So that would kind of have implicating implications on our border. But uh, they lost that two influence in Aragon, which is kind of a bummer for them. So we'll see. We'll see if that works out for them. So England, uh, we would go through the same kind of base check. Uh, you know, if they're under attack, if it's an end stage spent greater than whatever. Um, but we'll get to the same spot in the chart where they're going to get to draw a card. Uh, we have Papal Curia or Spy. So you go kind of top to bottom here. You would say, okay, Papal Curia, if that's a valid action, do that one. If it's not, then do a Spy action. So if we're if we're a Muslim faction and we get Papal Curia as a Spy, the Papal Curia is not applicable for us, so we would do Spy. And then the bottom part is if, if we're at war, always do Spy. But we're not at war. So we're going to spend two bot power, and we're going to do the Papal Curia action, which we'll scroll to now. You know, eventually you kind of do get the hang of how all these all work, but I want to go through and show them to you. So, has Catholic state religion? So, even, yeah, right right, right off the bat, if we're Muslim, we kind of back out of this one down here. Uh, yes, we are papal controller. Has uncontested control of the papal curia. So this is a nice time to kind of look at the papal curia track over here. Uncontested, so these are the four cardinals. There are four cardinals, because we have four players, or four Catholic factions. Uh, you get some nice bonuses for being the, the person in control of the curia. Um, that's the person with the most cardinals, or if you don't have the most cardinals, it's the you know the left most breaks ties. So actually, at the moment, Castile is the papal controller, so you pay less upkeep on advisors, you play less administrative to uh, raise your stability, you gain an extra diplomatic power, you can also excommunicate someone for two diplomatic power, or call the crusade for two. Uh, excommunicate is going to slap uh, another player or opponent. With some minus prestige, you kind of give you a custom spell against them. Crusade is similar, but you do it against Muslim factions, and it'll kind of give you like a little boost in manpower or what have you. There's two options uh, when you declare one on Muslim power. So England looks at this and they say, "Do I have uncontested control of the curia?" No, they don't even have 
um, contested control. Contested control is right now where Castile has control, but only because they, they're tie breaking. So they wouldn't get this. It's actually supposed to be one prestige, but they wouldn't get prestige in the round. It's not. It's, it's contested control. So they say, no, I don't have that. So it plays Cardinal on the papal track. Okay, so England is going to draw one from here. And the way this works is we're going to shift down everybody and drop this guy in here. Um, so although these slots are here, we're only going to use the we would only use these in a five or six player game or a five or six Catholic player game. Um, so they actually lose this one from the bottom of the throat. Yeah, I mean, England at the start of this time period is not exactly like, you know, the Pope's go-to guy. So they will lose that one. They do have control now, but it's contested. So it's not amazing, and they'll lose it quite in a tenuous, you know, they'll lose it this, the moment anyone else takes an action, but they do have control of it now. So they have place to track, and that's their round, essentially. Um, you see that if they are now the papal control of they would remove excommunication on their own ruler if applicable, but they they do not. Okay, yeah, jumping over now to Austria. Now, one of the things about Austria is that they do start the game as the Holy Roman Emperor. So you see the, the track down here at the bottom left. Uh, let's move around here. So the Holy Roman Empire is a part, big part of the game, especially if you're playing in the Holy Roman Empire or on its borders. This authority meter will kind of go up you can take a manual action to increase it, but it does increase from certain effects, like in the video game where uh, if a foreign nation invades the HRE and the emperor's, you know, like uh, feeling a little too uh, cowardly, then they can decline the call to, from their allies. Authority will go down. If an area in the empire leaves for whatever reason, it's taken over by somebody else or an event, Authority will go down, but it comes up if you reintegrate an area, if you take the action um, just to increase authority. There are a couple missions at the moment for Austria that will increase authority. Um, so that's kind of a nuts balancing act that you have to manage as Aust as uh, the emperor. And you can see that under each of the authority levels, you might get, for instance, plus one birth, plus one diplomatic power, or plus at six authority, max authority. You get two diplomatic power and one military power per round, every round. And then the level of authority also coincides with how much base tax income, or just tax income and manpower you get. So if I'm Austrian, I'm sitting at plus six authority. This is a very, you know, very secure empire, very centralized, very powerful. They're gonna get six extra income, six manpower, two diplomatic power and a military power every round. Um, so pretty strong. So, you know, emperorship is very important because if you look at Austria's kind of base start, it's not as huge as France, um, but they do have the emperorship to make up for it. And bear in mind that, you know, I've seen the games, I've seen game wars where Austria loses that emperorship thrown to somebody else. Um, you know, I'm playing in a game at the moment where Poland has it. Uh, you you know, when because when Austria's ruler dies, um, yeah, like I said before, you count up influence in each of the elector areas. There are one, two, three, four, five. Um, so if I have, you know, three French ones to, to one Austrian one, I would win this area. You're gonna count up who wins the most areas. The emperor gets to decide ties. Uh, and then after that, it switches control. So we could see, uh, maybe I'll go for a French emperorship. Uh, probably not. <laughs> it's a little tough. Cause you can only place influence in areas that are adjacent to places where you already have air influence or provinces. So I could do it. I could place like two here at a time, and then I could put two here and two here with the next action, and that would give me maybe control of three of the five areas. Um, at the moment, there isn't really, I know this is something that there's gonna be addressed is the bot kind of defending their emperorship and influence. That's not really done a ton at the moment, so I don't wanna kind of exploit that area of the undeveloped mechanics right now. Um, but yeah, that, yeah, talking about Austria being the emperor. Okay, uh, they're gonna, they would go through the same flow of the chart where they're not under attack, it's not in the end state, blah, 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 blah. So we have idea, cool. Uh, so they're gonna spend those first three military bot power. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna come over here to the ideas, I'm gonna copy paste this dice. So we have nine ideas on display. Um, 
So first, what we do, I'll, I'll, I'll just go, just go over to here. Like I said, you, you kind of get the hang of what all of these say, because they're not terribly complicated. Uh, but we see, do we have any focus? We haven't seen a focus card yet, so that we'll ignore that part, but that would be a no. Uh, and then we're going to roll dice, uh, focus type, one to two, admin, three, four, diplomatic, five, six, military. And then within that, we would, um, you know, say, uh, we would just basically just choose one of the ideas. The bots at the moment, uh, you do get victory or prestige for getting ideas. Um, They don't get a mechanical bonus for having the ideas, but they, at the moment, but they will later on. Um, so let's say what we're doing, we're off share right now. One, two, three, four, five, six. We roll. We get a one, so we're doing administrative. And then within these, they kind of have rules for, you know, prefer an idea that doesn't have anyone else taking it, and then prefer some one that a bot has over one that a, a player has, that kind of thing. But this is the first idea of the game, so again, we'll do one, two, three, four, five, six. So they got in here, they now put their little cube, we'll put it uh, We'll put it here. Now these little numbers on here are a lot dated. This would indicate that you get five prestige. Well, I won't go over the old rules, but the, the new rules are that you get three prestige anytime you research an idea. If, when someone researches an idea, everyone who already had that idea would then get a further two prestige on top of it. So that's to kind of indicate that, uh, you know, people are copying our technology. So if I'm first to research like I said, the Austrians are first to research adaptability. Then if we were to research adaptability later on, Austria would kind of get like a trickling in benefit from other people kind of copying them. So if you do kind of do a good job of identifying an idea that everyone else is going to want early on, and you can kind of zip in there first, uh, that can definitely pay off for you in terms of prestige. That's their whole turn. Um, yeah, we're back to us now under France. So we actually got pretty lucky. We actually got a decent amount of money here. Um... Do we want to just... How much longer do we... It's already six, so we already got... Okay, so we're in a fair way. We might just, you know, build up... We might just uh, build up for... To try to take back our land for the English here for fun. So the first thing we're going to do is we will shift our focus to military power. We're going to need our military power for the coming battles. When you do a focus, you can also kind of do some card discard and draw. So we could discard up to three cards... So we can add the yeah we can discard two cards to draw one card and we can discard three cards to draw two cards of our choice. We're gonna do the latter. I actually really want a specific military card, so we're gonna burn those three to draw two more military cards. Oh, and I did get the one I wanted, which is siege assault, and we actually got a pretty good general too. Three 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 of the colored cubes is essentially the best type of general you can get. Uh, we don't have cannons, so obviously cavalry would have been better here, but this is, this is not terrible. So that's our action. That's, 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 our, that's our whole turn. So I'm going to zip over back to walk to Castile now. Now they're going to do something a little different. Because I, if you remember from earlier, we hit something earlier in their base chart. So, nope. No on this one. Under attack. No, they're not under attack. There's no enemies in their realm. But the army is on the map board and can siege in the same area since it's somewhere where we're at war with somebody. Uh, so we're gonna go to the siege action. So the siege action says, siege provinces up to three tax income spend one bot power per tax income siege. And then there's some rules of preference. Uh, there's only one province to siege. So we're gonna spend our one bot power in Castile. We'll now have successfully sieged up Navarra. When you see something, uh, you get it in an unrest state to indicate that, you know, you've just taken it by force. So the occupants are a little unhappy with you. So after the siege, that's it. Oh, actually, uh, at war or promises left to siege in this area or adjacent areas? No. So they're actually gonna go ahead and remove their army. Actually, doesn't it say at war? At war or? Yeah, it says at war or. Okay, so just, the, they're still at war, so the army stays there. That's the Castilian turn. Uh, over to England. They are not at war or anything, so they go through the standard flow chart. So we have diplomacy card. Uh, the diplomacy annex part, that's a little outdated. So they're just going to do the di base diplomacy chart flow. There is only one diplomacy chart flow. If, if you know, if annex is appropriate, then we do annex. In the, alliance. the other one is alliance. So that's so. This says, do we have an alliance and a marriage with any NPR? They do, actually. Portugal. I think England's the only fashion of the game that starts with this. But they have an alliance and marriage with Portugal. This is interesting here. Yeah. 
So they say, yes, has higher tax income than the NPR. England's tax income, we can calculate quickly over here, is, well, actually, so, you know, they'd have a six. This is the 12th spot, this is the fourth spot, so it's 16. Poland, or Portugal is not that, it's gonna be one, two, three, four, five, six. I don't think I'm forgetting anything. Six, six, so yeah, much higher. Um, has in so yes has influence equal to or greater than the target's tax income so that influence is referring to influence in portuguese areas so we see that has influence greater than or equal to the target's tax tax income no we only have two income in the areas we do count the royal marriage as one free influence essentially is what the royal marriage says that's only three we do six so no any free space in target's areas so that refers to the fact that we can only have five max in an area so there's three in Portugal itself, but there's, you know, Macro... Macaronesia, I don't think I ever said that out loud. That's, got, that's all free. They're also in Northern Morocco. That's all free. So yeah, ton of free space. So, we say yes, add two influence in target's areas. Prefer target's capital. So their target's capital is here. And we're gonna add that directly. So we're gonna add two influence to Portugal itself. Okay, cool. Now what do we do? It says two plus influence in an NPR and alliance possible. Um, well, we had two plus influence, but alliance is not possible because we already have one. And there's no, yeah, no, it's, we already have an alliance, but because you, know, you can get to that point from different areas. So no, can't enter a royal marriage. No, because we already have one. So if space add two influence in other areas of target realm. So they have two other areas, so they have this one in northern morocco so and this is one of those occasions when the ai does go alphabetically so they go to mac over northern morocco so we're going to put two more over here now as you remember they have a tax income of six so we can actually now hit six in their areas which won't happen you know so nothing happened right now but well actually will it Oh, well, maybe we'll let's see. Let's see what happens. Let's just keep going. So, can enter world marriage? No. If space add two, blah 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 blah. Did it have four plus bot power left? Yeah, we do. We got four. So we're gonna go to the dipl diplomatic target chart for England. All right, let's roll our dice here. I think it's the one over here. Well, we got a four. We got Brittany. Interesting. Any free spaces in targets areas? Yeah. There's a bunch. Have influence less than targets tax income. Yeah. Spend two more bot power to add two influence in any of their areas. A lot of influence going down for England right now. So that might seem like a lot of influence to place at once. What do they do? They did they did two down here, two down here, two up here. So that's six. Um, so you start with three, um, but you know we focus two military. We got we have five military power. This is most of their turn, honestly. So we can place five. We can spend a couple of ducats. You know this alone is twenty one. So that would buy us seven influence. So that alone, you know, it seems like a lot, but really a player could do that as well. So it, it's actually totally within reason um, that they would do that. So that's England's turn. Jumping over. Now they actually almost had a power. So they'll probably pass or take an event on the next. They'll definitely take an event on the next turn. So Austria. What does Austria do? Papal Curia. So they want to get on this papal action. So they're going to spend the two ball power. They're going to go over here. They're going to shift these down. Bummer for me. We've lost our cardinal. And we're going to replace that with an Austrian one. So Austria is now, now, Austria has uncontested control since they have, they're not tying. Um, so that's gonna give them some prestige in the end the round. Now it's back to us. Oh, did I say we're gonna go to war? Okay, uh, well, we'll do a recruit action here. We'll take a recruit, oops. Take a recruit. We're probably not gonna work something up. So what we'll do, what we'll do here. We've got two armies. Da, 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 da. This is what we gotta think. What are we gonna do? I 
think what we're gonna do is we're just gonna buff up our mate when we up here. So we'll spend, we've already spent the one. We'll build, I think two more infantry. No, three more infantry. So that's six, put away, put aside six. And we'll get another cavalry for five. And I said we want mercenary up, but we, we actually get a mercenary up. We'll, uh, we'll just grab the four for now. There's gonna be, I think, well, I think it is actually. I can't remember. There's, I think there's going to be 25 of these in the final product I think, of the game. Now, mercenaries cost. They don't cost you any manpower, but they do cost two extra ducats on top of the base count. And they cost two at upkeep instead of one. Um, so it's going to be four for an infantry, seven for a cavalry, and eight for an artillery. That's quite a lot of money. Um, now, if we were really try hard and key, we would kind of like calculate what I think that we're gonna go with, but we're just gonna kinda play this a little loose. So we're gonna go with two infantry. We'll just kill those off, because we can just copy and paste stuff. So that's gonna cost us another eight, since those are four each. So there goes our, our sweet treasury we built up, but we now have a pretty large army. Okay, that's my turn. Heading over to Castile, they go through, they are at war, but they're not gonna get, I don't think they're gonna get, blocked on any of the earlier parts of the turn. Nope, they got power power left, they're not under attack. They, they can't siege anymore, there's nothing more to siege. No colonists, nope. Uh, yes, they're gonna get back, back to their cards. So they go to the diplomacy flow. One interesting thing is you actually can't make an alliance while you're at war. So we'll have to keep that in mind for their diplomacy flow. All right, alliance and a marriage within the NPR. They don't. They don't start with any marriages or alliances. Alliance within the NPR. Mm, no, none. Have two plus influence in an NPR when an alliance possible. So they lost that influence that they had in Aragon, um, but they also would not be able to make an alliance because they're at war. So both of those are no. So we go to the diplomatic target chart for Castile, diplomacy, down here at the bottom one. We roll our dice. We get three, Aragon. So I think they're gonna go back into Aragon with some influence here. So, already allied, no. Any free space in target areas? Yes, we're gonna add two in their capital area, preferably. So we're gonna add the two back in here. Um, do, 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 where'd we go? Any free space, you add two. Two plus influence in an NPR and alliance possible, nope. Can enter a royal marriage though, yes. So on a one, two, three, we just add more influence on a four, five, six royal marriage. Yeah, so we're just gonna we're just gonna go to that no there on or the left path. If space add two plus influence in other areas of target realm. So Yeah, so we can place area influence in Corsica and Sardinia or Sicily because we have influence in the central Italy and Lombardy adjacent areas. Because as you notice, Castile isn't actually adjacent. Although we had a, no, we had a province here, so this would have been adjacent to Corsica's opinion anyway. Um, so this will be another situation where the AI uses alphabetical to choose an area. Uh, Corsica in Sardinia is first, so we're gonna add two more influence in Corsica and Sardinia. Okay, have four plus bot power left. Yeah, again, we do. So we're gonna roll again on this target chart to see where else we're gonna put some influence. Two. Same realm again. Uh, roll for target. Reroll if same target as previous. Okay, don't say that. So we're gonna roll again. Six. Um, what am I thinking? Uh, so that was a re-roll. That wasn't us rolling again from the Aragon route. That we actually just straight up re-rolling. So we got Portugal. Yeah, Portugal is about a target. So any free space in target areas. Yeah, not in Portugal itself, but these two expansion areas. Oops, we tried. Uh, so we're going to have... Has influence. No, we don't. We only have one influence in Portuguese areas. Oh, no, no, it has influence less than target. Yes. So spend two BP more, and then we're going to put some influence there. So again, a lot of influencing. And a lot of really big influence actions coming out from the boss this round. So we'll put a, uh, again, they're gonna kinda c compete down here um, in Macaronesia for Portuguese influence. It's kinda funny. 
Okay, back to England. Uh, England is going to get to that, you know, has more spent BP than available BP. Yeah, in here. So they say, over here, at war? They're not at war. Has picked event? No. So they're going to go to event. They say, already taken event action. Nope. We're going to roll the dice. Well, we can solve that chat. We got a one, it's kind of a questionable roll. We got a one, pick the leftmost revealed event. That is revolts. That's gonna be annoying. I think they're gonna annoy me. Is this an opponent event? No, it's just a general event. So trigger option A on event. So I'm gonna put the little England symbol here. And then we're gonna, or you can do it that way or you can just kind of take the event away yourself and then put this symbol here. I, I'm kind of used to doing it this way. So I wonder if some of the bot events have specific, either a lot of events have specific rules that the bot takes them. Yeah, like revolts, same as heretics, except no diverse. So what does heretics say? Bots alphabetically select area adjacent to own realm, which contains opponent towns, place diverse faiths token, and add unrest to two towns. So they're gonna select an area alphabetically. And I think they prioritize me. Ah, but this is an area. Okay, let's see. Let's see again here. Alphabetically select area adjacent to own realm, which contains opponents' towns. No effect to own areas. There's no effect to own areas, so they wouldn't choose Aquitaine, which is the I think the only other A area that contains my towns. But Aragon. Also, is already maxed out on unrest. This is an interesting case here. Select area adjacent to own realm, which contains opponents' towns. Oh, it is. Oh, we're not doing that. The unrest, though. Hmm. Hmm. So I don't think they choose Aquitaine because it's their own area. Wait, it contains my towns, but it's also theirs. It, this, we both own this area. It's kind of interesting. Um. So Sen. Brittany and Normandy? No, that's not. No opponent towns there. Castile and Argentina to Leon. They're adjacent to Leon. And Languedoc. But Languedoc will do it first there. So, yeah. I believe they choose Languedoc. Which is not. I was kind of trying to weasel my way into hoping they're going to choose Castile there, but they're not going to. So, they're going to place Diverse Faiths token and add unrest into two towns, for example. So we're gonna get this un unrest token or religious diverse fates. We'll put that on that. And they're gonna add unrest to two towns. We only have two. Just like put those two in unrest. Very uncool, Mr. Mr. England. Um, and then this symbol here, at the bottom of the event, you basically you resolve all the text, the top section on an event, and then afterwards you resolve these little side effects at the bottom. We're gonna do our little event track update there. So that a rebel flag in the bottom left means we have to roll for any unrest that everyone has. So I have two unrest now, thanks to our very cool England bot here. So we're gonna roll two unrest dice. Hopefully we don't get something. Okay, that's not great. <laughs> uh, so this one is remove unrest. So we'll choose that. We'll choose this one. Doesn't really matter. I guess the bot province is all, the the port province is all important. And this one is. Rebellion results. So that means that if we had an army here or any military units, it would spawn one rebel unit and then we would fight the rebel unit. But since we don't, this actually gets taken over by rebels. So we now lose control of this area. We're going to take a little marker and we're going to put this on a little track here to indicate that we don't have that. Uh, so we're going to have to siege this back now, which has kind of thrown our war into question now. Because now do we kind of prioritize taking this back or do we take that back frustrating to say the least and then the other action you'll see is a plus icon for ill health so do we have any plus icon we do thomas thomas has received ill health so he's getting closer to the grave so that was england's turn uh yeah That's, they get to you know, they don't follow the event exactly they follow closer to here which was following heretics oh no i'm sorry no we didn't do heretics did we we did revolts so we actually don't place that. Okay, that's not as bad. We just get the we just get the unrest. 
that's better. Because that's actually quite annoying, because converting an area is a pain. Because I would have to retake that area from the bottom, then, yeah. That's good. That's good. Okay, back over to Austria. They're equal. So they actually keep going if they're equal on ball power remaining for spent. So they say, okay, go, 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 focus. So this is a focus action. They, they can't convert. They All of their areas are already Catholic. So they say, ah, oh, I'm focusing on warfare now. So that the way the bots score milestones is once they get two cubes um, in one of the area, in one of the focus areas, they remove both of those and then they score the appropriate um, milestone. So if, if Austria gets another focus action, no matter what the, the type it says on there, since they already have a focus, it will go into warfare, so they'd have two, so they would then score this warfare action. Um, and then we would go kind of into the focus start. We actually actually just go to the focus start here. That makes a lot more sense. The focus action, you'll see that, you know, um, they have potential to get bot power back and prestige the same way a player would score prestige. Um, and that's kind of based on if, you know, what focus they're scoring, if there's an awesome matching and then the order in which, you know, they're, they're scoring in front of other people. So that's actually the kind of one we were going for. So it's going to be, it's important that we score that before Austria because, you know, if we score first, we get five, they get three. If we score second, they get five, we get three. So that's actually a four victory point swing between the two of us. So that's kind of important. I get that first. So that's the Austrian turn. Back to us. Uh, I don't know if this is a good idea, <laughs> but we're going to do it anyway for fun here uh, as we approach the end. Uh, we're going to declare war on this English player who's kind of annoying us. So we're going to take our respective war tokens. I put mine on London. He puts his on Paris. Now we check if there's any immediate war, uh, any immediate battle out of there. I don't have... Now, for uh, against an NPR, this would cause a battle since we have guys in their area. But we this, we're not in the same area as their armies or their military units. Our ships aren't in this area, the same area as their ships, so there's no immediate battle. So we get to do an army activation for free here. Uh, when you declare one faction, actually, they get a ball power. Or they get a military power normally, but as a bot gets a ball power. So that way you can't just, like, you can't wait until someone's out of military power and then just attack them and then they can't do anything about it. Um, what are we going to do? Let's just move our army into Brittany and Normandy here. We could also move two down into Loire and pick up this guy. So that we're not spread out. And take Bordeaux instead. Uh, I actually like that a bit more. So we're going to march down into Aquitaine, and we're going to pull this guy off the board and kind of merge these two armies into one. So we got a pretty big old, big old army here. And that's the end. That's well, we could see Sol. Mm, we'll hold that. We'll hold that. Or will we? Or will we, viewer? Uh, I don't know. We'll see. We'll see. Well, for now, no. Well, we're not going to do it. Okay. So Castile, they say, oh. I've got more bot power spent. So they're gonna go to that event stage. And event. 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 So it'll be easier once you have it in kind of a hard copy in front of you. Since it's not the scroll. Oh, the way it's really tough. I do kind of know the event off the top of my head, but it's good to show it. So event already taken. Nope. We're gonna roll. For steel. Get three, pick rightmost revealed event. Now you do see that there are options to kind of like four, five, or six. Like half the time, they're just going to do it based on like, oh, is an opponent one there? Is one of mine one there? And they're going to choose based off that. But they're actually going to be choosing the rightmost event. Unhappy peasants. Okay. Kind of, I don't think this is going to, I think this is also going to annoy us here. So again, we're going to put some more money on these. Flip the last one. So I think. Pretty sure this is going to be a, one that the bots are special for. What was that? Those Unhappy Peasants, I think it was called? Yeah, Unhappy Peasants. Do they have a special rule for this one? I don't think so, actually. Uh, there is a comment side of the event for any of the uh, Paradox fans out there. Lose stability. Standard stuff. No, okay, they actually don't have it. Which is actually surprising to me, because they don't have money. Okay. But it does say for event actions, 
Uh, da -da -da. Is this an appointment? No, trigger option A on the vent. So they say, we rule as we see fit, gain one prestige and lose one stability. So we'll do, we'll do, Castile's obviously gonna do it. Um, so they choose the A, they say, oh, give me one prestige. And they lose one stability. So I think it says here, whenever instructed to, instead of losing stability, gain one unrest. So they would gain one unrest somewhere instead. So as a bot, they want to prioritize negative effects on their smaller towns. And we go alphabetically to Badalhof, I believe. Yeah, so we'll put that in unrest. And then they would choose an opponent. This is another player, but I believe that should be another opponent. But I'm pretty sure they prioritize a player over a bot in this scenario. So they're going to choose me. So I get to choose that. Do I want to gain one prestige and lose a stability, or do I want to gain five ducats? You know, we're actually going to go with B here. We're going to gain five ducats. And my reasoning for this is we're going to add unrest down here in Montpellier and add a rebel here. Rebel, rebel, rebel. Um, oh, no, actually. No, 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 That's the big dumb. We'll do it here. No, we'll choose, I don't know. We'll choose El Ponto. So this would immediately trigger a battle. Um, uh, well, I'll, I'm not even, I'm, not, I'm gonna, sh I'll, I'll say, I'll say Charles the Seventh is actually an acting general. I think there's gonna be a special token for this, but uh, for now we just put the Royal Marriage token here. He's also a general now. Uh, so the rebels, they roll three, st the standard stock white, three dice. I roll three white dice, the standard, and then Charles VII also gives me three white dice, so I got six white dice. So I just roll those up, Rebels roll those up. I got five infantry hits. They got three hits, but they only have one infantry, so they just get one infantry hit. So we're gonna, oh no, whatever mercenaries, oh no. I think there's gonna be some rules on when you can assign hits to mercenaries. You can't just like meat shield them, but none for now. Uh, and then the Rebel dice. I was originally thinking that since we already have unrest here, it might make sense to just put it put, put them both in Languedoc since we have to come down there to deal with it anyway. But this way, I can kind of just kill the guy as we go, and I'll be able to remove the unrest from Aquitan by purging this claim on the peace stage. So it's actually a better play. Normally, you get a bot, you get a military power when you win the battle, but only on your turn. So since that was Castile's turn, we don't get it. Uh, and then that bottom left token on this one, that is lost at sea. Um, so that's kind of like a disincontinence one. Or if you have ships at a long distance, um, you could lose your ships, essentially. But this does, this, this, that doesn't apply here, so we're going to continue on. Back to England. Now, now, so now so England is now a war. So this is going to be totally different. So they say, ball power left is zero. No, I think they have three left, something like that. Yep, three. Under attack, enemies within own realm. Yes. So Aquitaine counts as part of their realm, and I am inside of it. So yes, go to defend. So spend, it also says go to defend, spend one bot power. So we're gonna spend one bot power. Then we're gonna go find defend. Oh, it's right there. Defend, enemy is inside own realm. Yes. Has four plus bot power. No, we do not. Army size is greater than or equal to any invading enemy force. Uh, their army size is only two at the moment, so that's definitely not true. Because we only had we only had that one army because we merged them together. But if we'd left that one one army, then that would actually have been true. So this would have gone totally differently if we'd done that. Um, so no has four power, power left. Nope. Army deployed in an area where it can siege. Nope. If army is less than three units, yes. I think it's two. We just said increase army size to three. They only have one type. They basically only have infantry to worry about. So they're up to three. Any area with own province occupied by enemies. Uh, no, not yet. Place army in closest hostile area with no enemy units. Prefer area with highest enemy tax income. Uh, that's going to be kind of annoying, actually. <laughs> uh, 
Hmm. For place army in closest hostile area with no enemy units. I think they're gonna send their army over into the Sen here, because this is a bigger this is hostile units. Could they get oh no they can get here too, they can get to the war. Yeah, because it has one, two, three, four, five against four. So this guy's a little it's gonna have like a sneak past me here into the war. Area, which is somewhat annoying, <laughs> because now if I stay here to siege. They're gonna siege me up. Hmm, tricky, tricky, tricky. Okay, we'll have to deal with that on our turn. Uh, Austria, they're gonna take an event because they have more spent than available. We're gonna roll six. I believe that means they take their own event. We're gonna double check that though. Of course. Six is, nope, opponent event revealed, yes. Pick event of opponent who is leading on the prestige track. Uh, there's only one, there's only a one opponent event, so it's, it's Castile. Get, so. They don't actually claim these two ducats. There might be a rule later on uh, added. I'm not sure. It would kind of make sense where they kind of get bot power based on the number of coins on the event. But they're mean. They say, I don't want you to have that. Opponent event, I'll trigger option B. So, um, married local noble instead for Castile. So, Austria gains one diplomatic power. That gets translated into one bot power. So they gain one bot power. Uh, Castile loses one prestige. So that one prestige that they had is now gone. Uh, they gain a stability. So that means they get to remove an unrest. And that goes to Badahoff alphabetically. Um, and must discard two influence from Aragon. So there, that influence that that's coming on and off. I tell you, they go. So that's their turn. Um, yeah, that's their turn. that's my turn. So as we said, we have a tough choice of if we. So on the English turn, it's good to kind of figure out what they'll do. And I believe that they will probably siege us up here. We'll double check this one, because this is quite important. So we would go to defend, where they would spend once. They'd be down to one bot power. And we have inside own realm, yes. Has four plus bot. And army and area can siege. No, not and. Army is greater than or equal to no. Has four bot power, but no. Army can siege in an area where it can siege. Yeah, so yes. So they would siege up one province where they have one more house. They probably so they would siege up Barry. They would siege up Barry on their turn, which would be frustrating. But if we go back here, then it's kind of annoying for us. We could split the army. We could send off some troops and to go knock them out. That might be a good idea. Because that would still then leave enough to siege down Bordeaux later. Yeah, I think we'll do that. I think we'll split off here. So we're gonna, we're gonna create army two here, from here. Uh, then uh, we'll bring the mercenaries, the cavalry, because they're not gonna be useful in the siege. Um, then we'll leave, how many guys they have? They have three guys? We'll leave no, we only need two. We only need two siege power over there, so we'll be. Uh, but they could come back in. Is the thing. They can come back in on their turn, potentially. So they have three guys. We have a good general. We might do something like this. Five. We just need to win the battle. Yeah, we just need to. Win. So we'll do this. So we're gonna go in. Um, okay, so the bot is gonna roll there. The bot against a player will roll five white dice. Um, we have six. What a white dice here. Um, okay, we got Charles seven. Yeah, so we're just gonna roll up here. I got. Ooh, that's not. Oh, wait, no, no, we just need three, right? So that's, yeah, two infantry hits and a cavalry hit. So perfect. We actually got just barely enough to wipe them out here. Uh, this is a miss. This is a cavalry attack. We actually got two, two of these symbols. Normally, that would actually mean that we place a ill health token on the leader of their force. Uh, they don't have to. They don't. They don't have generals. 
But if they get that against us, then for instance, we would actually take no health token on our king, which would be annoying. That's kind of one of the risks of putting a general in the battle. And I'm actually pretty sure the bot only hits on infantry results. So that was actually a pretty fortunate battle there for us. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm like I'm like 95%, so I'm gonna make, I'm correct here, but I want to go up that section. Yes, we are best. Yeah, so land battles. Uh, land battles respond when bots face opponents in battle. The normal battle sequence is followed. Bots always roll five infantry dice. Bots never use multi cards. Count all of a bot's units as infantry. Yeah, so they only got one hit. No, so we just kill off our mercenary here. And this guy's still packing. These three guys are returned to the manpower. And we gain a military power for winning the battle. Oh, I think. I don't think we actually spent anything to activate that army. Because we started with five, we recruited, we were at four, we moved, we were at three. Yeah, we were, yeah, we were at five, we recruited down to four, we declared war and moved for three. Yeah, so we should, have spent, well, we should have spent one more and then we should have gotten one back. So we should be back to three. Uh, Castile. Castile, 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 Castile. I believe we're going to pass. <sighs> Under attack? No. Army on board? Nope. Colonists, nope. Spent, yes. Has at war, nope. So they have picked an event, yes, pass. So Castile is the first to pass. Oh, we actually didn't update that, did we? So they're gonna gain, for a bot to do it, they gain two bot power next. So they're gonna gain, we're just gonna store what they're gonna get. Well, actually, what do we do now? So they get two bot power. We're gonna take this off to indicate that, you know, remember that they've passed. Okay, so that's that. England. England, what are you doing about it here? Yeah, they're gonna go to defend still. With their one bot power left. We're kinda lucky, we're kinda like picking these, we're kinda like invading England as they're very low on bot power. Um, bots typically have less resources and less bot power on the first turn they are gonna, than they're gonna do on, it, on subsequent turns. Um, Generally, you're not going to be fighting an opponent, a bot, on the first turn, but we were kind of just doing it for fun to see how well it's going to go. It's actually going kind of well for us so far. So, enemy distance, I don't realm. Yes. Uh, nope. Army, you're not really, Nope. Nope. They don't have an army. Uh, four plus bot power. Nope. Army deployed in there. Nope. Nope. If army is greater than, if that's three units, increase army size to three units. So, they do that again. So, they recruit back up to three. Recruit back after three. Any area with owned provinces occupied by enemies. Nope, so no. So they're actually going to go again in the closest hostile area with no units. So they're going to recruit another little measly force and they're going to send it to the Seine. But critically, on their next turn, they're going to hit defend and they're going to spend their only bot power so they actually won't be able to afford anything to siege. So it's actually not imperative that we knock those guys out. Okay, then Austria. Since they got that bot power from the event, they can actually take another turn here. Since they're not greater than here. So, ooh, so they got another focus. Good for them. So they get two in warfare, which is what they wanted. Ooh, that's unfortunate for us too here. So they're going to score this first milestone. They get five prestige. Austria taking our lead. Go to the focus action. Remember how much they gain from this. Because you see on, on that focus action, we'll, we'll take a look again, but for a player that would give us five ducats for the bot, they gain two bot power and proceed just almost. They're gonna gain two bot power. They, they're gonna remove this. Actually, so we can just take, basically just take those two back off. So they've gained the two bot power and that goes back to their pool. Bummer. Yeah, we wanted that one. You wanted that one. So it's back to us. I'm going to spend two military power to siege Bordeaux. Yeah. So we take a big one. And we're going to put that here. So we've taken Bordeaux. Cool. I don't think we're going to have to take Brittany and Normandy this turn. Uh, well, maybe. Unless. Unless. Okay, I got an idea. An idea. This might work. This might be a genius move. Uh, they've passed, so we're gonna skip right past them. England, we go through the same fall, we hit defend, but they're not gonna have any... 
But we're not gonna have anything to siege with, so let's just see what happens here. I don't think I'm yeah, I think that's correct. Okay. Yeah, under attack, enemies are still within their own realm, so we spend we spend and we go to defend. Yes. No. 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 Uh. I'm gonna play in an area where it can siege provinces. They can't afford to siege provinces though. So what would they do if it was a no? That would stay there. That would just go to the end. But siege is also gonna be the same. Uh, I think either way, they actually don't do anything here. Um, yeah, siege probably is up to three attacks and can spend one for attacks and can siege. Yeah, uh, I think they, they can't really do anything. They were too unprepared for this war to come off guard. Back to Austria. We're still going here. Event, uh, they already have an event. So I think we just redraw? Let's get let's see. Event already taken. Yeah. Discard event block card, go back to main turn structure. Oh, they go back to main turn structure, which would loop us back through into another card. So they got unrest. Or the other wait, did we get a focus more the first one? No, we did, yeah. It's interesting. So they don't have any unrest. So they're actually gonna focus warfare again. Now, you'll notice that they've already scored the warfare milestone. They can do it again, but they're just gonna get free prestige and nothing else. So it's not, it's not a little unfortunate that they got the warfare one there. Okay, so here's my scheme now. So we're gonna take, we're gonna take this guy over here. We're gonna take, ooh, is it actually, is it better for us to do the top one or the or border fiction? So we have, I wanna get, basically I wanna get one more military power. I can do it with this event or I can do it with this event. Um, this would allow me to get a, another claim but lose three differences. I think we could gain that to get a claim somewhere we don't have, where we don't lose anything. So we would avoid giving Austria prestige when they're already ahead and a claim, but we get six ducats. So it's like, oof, we gotta weigh this up basically um, with what we think is better. Six ducats, six ducats for one victory point, I think is worth it, who knows? Might get some, might get some disagreements on that one. That's a, that's a, that's a close question though. So we'll take that. We're not going to bother adding money to this one because this is the last event being taken. So Austria gains a prestige and a claim there. So Austria. Again, this would be a numbered claim. We're not going to bother with it for right now though. Uh, yeah, we'll push right there. Was it a negative prestige? And I gain a military power, which is what we want. We want to have two. Castile passed. England passes. Yeah, England passes. They're the second to pass. They're out of bot power, so they're always going to pass. And they take the defense, so they pass. So they get one bot power for this. We'll take this off, just to remember. Uh, then Austria. Austria's still going. They're going to convert. Or Papal Curia. Ooh, I think no, they're going to do. So they're going to Papal Curia. But they already have control. Don't they? Yeah. So if they do a papal action, when they already have control. Yeah. Catholic has access to control the paper. Yeah. H one or two. Yeah. Adjacent to Muslim realm. Now you might be thinking. Hold on. Venetia is maybe adjacent to the. Ottomans, but I think this is going to change. This is going to be cleared up. These two areas aren't actually adjacent, even though it touched by the same sea zone. It has to touch a port. I think this is going to get looked at, but for now, these areas are not adjacent. So they're actually not adjacent to any Muslim realm, which is a bummer. I would have loved for them to go. I know what they're going to do. I think so. No, any Catholic opponents. Yes. Um, excommunicate opponent's ruler. Prefer realm at war with bot. Nah, there's no one wrong with them. So unfortunately, they choose 
a player over another bot, so they're gonna excommunicate me. <laughs> I don't, I don't love it. I don't love it. That's kind of one of the, thing, the tough parts about playing with all the bots is that you're gonna find yourself focused a little more, you know, than you would normally do. But you know, you're gonna uh, some bots, so that's that's just part of the difficulty. And I actually don't get excommunicated too often, <laughs> so I don't a hundred percent remember all of the effects of excommunication. I think it's like one of the last pages in here. I think it's like you have to remove influence from certain, I think you just remove, you get lose some prestige and you lose some influence from Catholic areas. Yeah, excommunicate. The play realm, I lose prestige. I don't actually have any prestige and you can't go negative. Uh, one cardinal, don't have any. Uh, remove four influence from Catholic areas. That's kind of wrong. And everyone's going to have a cast spell against me. So I have to remove four influence. I only have four influence. I guess they don't like my warmongering, I suppose, which is fair enough, but there goes all my influence. I'm doing so poorly uh, on these other things that I'm actually lose anything. Okay, well, that was kind of mean. Uh, so now, now, I'm going to spend one bot point, or sorry, one military power, to activate this army. We're gonna move it up here, and then we're gonna play Siege Assault. Play following an activation, yeah. It costs one military power, you see in the top left there. In the top left. So I have to spend another one to play that, so we got none left. And it says, this army may immediately siege a number of provinces up to its siege strength at no extra military cost. So my siege strength would be one, two, three point five, three point five. Um, roll infantry dice equal to tax income of provinces sieged and take a casualty for each infantry result. At least one unit must remain for sieges to succeed. So we're going to try to siege all three of these guys. So we're going to roll three infantry dice here. Hoping that the dice gods favor me. Uh, yeah, that, that's, that's pretty good. That's pretty good. So we take one casualty. Uh, and then it succeeds. So, wow. This, this has been pretty, this has been pretty cool. This, this, this war is paying off for us. We'll see if we can hold any of this and then the rebel phase, but it's going pretty well. Cool. Very cool. Passed. Passed. Austria. Yep, this now exceeds, uh, you know, spent more than they got, and they're not at wars. They pass. So at this point, three players have passed. I am now forced to take one more action um, and then pass. Uh, if I haven't taken an event yet, then... That has to be that, then that turn is spent taking an event and then passing. But we already have an event, so we get one more action here. Um, I don't know. Um, I don't know. What are we gonna do? This is stuck, you know. Um, cheeky trade? I think we just do a cheeky trade here. See what we get. Maybe get some extra money. Some other stuff we can do. Oh. Yeah, we're getting some great trade rolls here, man. Some great trade rolls. But this is kind of handy, because... If, if I didn't, if I can use any of these, then I can always get just two income. But we got pretty... We're getting real lucky here, guys. France isn't exactly a trade powerhouse at the start, but it definitely seems that way. So, we can get to Genoa or Bordeaux, so we can actually move this guy between them, since it's our trade action. I can get... I can activate Genoa, because it's adjacent to ships to the sea zone. So, Genoa would get us... Don't control Genoa. Don't control Rome. Do, do control the NA. Don't control Avignon. So it would be one for the ship, two for the merchant, three for the NA. So it gives us three, so it gives us 12 ducats. That's going to be the better one. This we're going to can't even get up to 12, but you can see that's Bordeaux when we do this, the sea zones. Oh, no, that's uh, Bordeaux. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We do the sea zones. We could do it over here, but this is going to be better. I'll tell you what, guys. Uh, if you're playing France and you take two trade actions, turn one, you're not going to get 22 ducats ever. This has been very good for us. This is probably one of the best round ones I've ever had against bots. So we just got 12 ducats here, boys. And there's no one's even adjacent to this, so no one else gets anything. This has been, this, this is fantastic. This is fantastic, look how much money I have. We have a uh, 15, 21, 25 ducats. And we're at war. That's great, that's great. Okay, uh, yeah, the bragging aside, uh, that's it, that's the end of the round. Uh, these guys have passed. I would pass when it comes back to me. That's it. That's it. Done. So now we're going to move on. Peace and Rebels. Remove all truce tokens, truce tokens from the board. There's none. 
invasions. So an invasion is if we're at war with an NPR and we don't have any troops in there in the NPR's areas. So let's say, you know, if I'm if I'm playing as a based Albania uh, and I'm going to Skanderbeg it on round one and I go, with my one tax income, I'm going to declare war on Ottomans. I go in with my one guy. Uh, I lose somehow, uh, which is, you know, because the Ottomans are probably cheating somehow with their Janissaries. They beat my one guy. Uh, so now we're at war. At the end step, we're now at war. I don't have any guys in their areas. Uh, so they trigger an invasion where basically they kind of choose one of my areas. They count up adjacent, um, you know, tax strength. So they would count up, I'm, I'm only in here. So they would count up the strength in Greece, Macedonia, and Wallachia. So like one, two, three, four, five, six. They don't have constant noble yet, we'll say. And then they invade my area um, based on that strength. So they would probably see, I think, uh, three guys come over and they would probably kill me. Um, and it would be bad. So that's what innovation is. That doesn't happen here. You know, the only NPR that's being at war is Navarra and Castile is in there, so. Doesn't happen. Uh, what are we going? Okay, next up. Uh, rebel units siege provinces. So that is when, if we have a rebel unit, like we saw get placed down earlier from that event, if we have a rebel unit somewhere where there's unrest, those rebels then actually siege those provinces and kind of do what they did down to Toulouse down here, where they would take it over. But there are no circumstances where that applies. Peace resolution. Okay, peace resolution. This is something I should have planned for, but I think we're actually good. So in the rules, we're going over the base rules here. Peace resolution, um, generally, basically the rule is if that if you fully occupy all their stuff, you defeat all the land units, which is what's going to happen on Castile's turn. You just annex them straight out. Um, now, against another player, generally, you're going to have to come to terms with them, unless your deployed land units outnumber the deployed land units of the opponent two to one. Um, so basically, if you're, if you're kind of winning a war, you've taken some stuff, and your army is, you know, twice as big as his, you can actually force a peace treaty on someone to stop them from just being like, anyone made peace, I can still win, but they can't still win. You know, you can force a war to end. And similarly with a bot, your deployed land units outnumber the total number of rebel units in your areas and deployed enemy land units. So my army is actually seven and the bot's army conveniently is three. So I can actually force a peace here. I can force a partial victory on the bot we're going to do conquest. First, return your opponent's enemy capital province. Don't have it, so it doesn't comply. But you may keep all other provinces that you have captured. We're going to do that. Um, yeah, we're just going to do that. We, we, we just win. We win, boys. We, we, we did it. Um, we did it. I've done it. I beat them. I beat them. We forced, so I forced a peace treaty on them. France has, you know, crushed the English in a war. Uh, this army's gonna dip on out of here. Back to their play area. Yeah, cool, cool. Like that went so much better than I thought it was gonna do, to be honest. <laughs> um, so the aftermath, well, 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 we'll finish, we'll do all of my, my war and then we'll go resolve the, the Castilian one. So after peace has been declared, if you have claims in any area which you captured enemy provinces, you may remove unrest from two towns in that area by removing your claim token. You must remove claims from any areas where you own everything. So we're going to remove, uh, so actually, well, yeah, first we take off these English provinces to say that, you know, these are now officially ours. You know, if, this, if I wasn't able to force peace here against the bot, the bot probably would have just kept going against us. Uh, I think, no, we don't have this. Where did this come from? All that stuff from up here. The bot probably would have just kept going against us. Against a player, you know, you really kind of have to... You really, yeah, I mean, you really have to play the diplomacy game, you know, because it's like, they can keep the war going, but if you keep the war going at the end of in the space peace round, you're going to have to add unrest to two, two of your own provinces. Uh, wars are expensive, you know, you let these things drag on for two, even three rounds with another player, that's going to take its toll big time. So, as an aggressive player, you really want to be able to put yourself in a position where you can force a peace treaty on the other guy, 
um, at the end of the round. You know, you'll go go Napoleonic, you know, and go fight, seek out the enemy's army and crush it, or you know, occupy so much of it that if they if they don't make peace, that it's going to kind of ruin them. Um, or you know, you can play diplomacy. You can offer things in the war. You can say, well, you know, you you give me these what I've taken here, I'll compensate you with some money maybe, or, you know, maybe even an overseas holding, you know, if we, if we go late in the game, you know, it's like, ah, well, Austria's, you know, like a French, maybe the French give uh, the Austrians Venice, uh, which, you know, they control um, to the Austrians in exchange for, you know, Austrian ceding control in Lombardy, which, you know, might sound familiar to some people. Um, but yeah, we've we've crushed these plots. We're gonna remove our claim here, which was our plan. So we now have no unrest here. That's kind of great. And then we are gonna remove our claim here. We don't have to. We could save it and then use it as a pretext to also attack Normandy, but we're not. We're just gonna choose two of these at random. Actually, we'll choose the two port. We'll choose the port ones. And that's our war. It went really well. Very happy with that. Uh, then we go over Castile. Castile does theirs. Uh, yeah, we're just gonna take that war. Since Navarre doesn't exist anymore, there's no there's no truce with them. And I believe they do some special stuff here where they actually get some bonus rewards for conquering things. Since they don't have, like, missions uh, that reward them for taking certain areas, they just get more. Yeah, so captured all provinces, destroyed all armies of the enemy. Yeah, gain prestige equal to enemies, original tax income. One. So Castile is back on the board. Big ol' one. So then they go around, all the way around to remove bots claim from area. They don't have one, I think, right? Oh, I think we missed a step, boys, actually. I think I should have, I think they should have made it. I think I, I said it, I didn't do it. They should have placed a claim in this area when they marched in. So we actually didn't do that. We kind of derped. Remove bots claim. Were they on all promises? No. No, they're not on all promises. That stays there. This this comes off. Um, Austria's not at war, so that's that's peace. That is the peace done. Stability and unrest. Um, so that's where we would add unrest from the stability level or religious dissent or ongoing wars. You see, like this this would have re removed unrest. This would add any. Uh, I'm at zero. There's no ongoing wars. There's no religion. Oh, actually, no, there is religious unrest down here in Andalusia. So it's a negative effect. So Castile prioritizes. Cordoba. This is Catholic, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, nothing Austrian is unresty. Nothing I have is an unrest. Nothing England has an unrest. Nope, nope, besides that. Then we do real rebel dice for unrest. So I have one rebel dice here. We're gonna roll this, and hopefully, hopefully we don't get a rebellion result. I'll be quite upset if we get a rebellion result. Okay, good, thank God. So we lose two tickets. Rebellion would have been awkward because it's an English province, so they, it already goes back to English control. Like, English partisans basically come in and they take control back, and then we have an awkward decision of whether we want to go back to war or not for it. I think this was supposed to be discarded. So, we just lost some money. Uh, court, yeah, Spanish. The boss do roll rebel dice, just like, just like us. They got, ooh, they got rebels. Yeah, looks like we got some... Some rebels taking over down here in Andalusia. Discontented. England, no unrest. Austria, no unrest. Okay, cool, done. Fire advisors disband military units and recall ships at sea. Do we want to, we probably, uh, this is a good question actually, if we want to disband our military units. I think we probably, we have tons of money, there's no real, uh, two ships at sea that cost one, so we're down to 13. Uh, advisors upkeep. These guys are two each, so we're down to nine. Interest on loans, we have none. Subtract or add for stability, nothing. So nine. We're gonna get another nine here, guys. We are rich. This is crazy. This is one of the best rounds I've ever had. This friends. Collect bonus points, but we do kind of. This is where it gets a little, a little, a little rougher. So we're gonna gain five administrative power. Ding, da, da, ding. Well, we gain a sick one diplomatic power. <laughs> We're being very, very bellicose here uh, as the French, which maybe is appropriate. No offense to any French people. 
Uh, update and refresh manpower. Wait, we got our one manpower back. Uh, merchants, yeah, our merchants go back standing up. They are refreshed. Discard that to my heart times of five. Nope. And we're actually, we would actually have done this right after the Peace and Rebels phase, I guess. Depends on what we can do this whenever. We'll do it right now for simplicity, though. We're going to complete our two missions. We're going to say, I've done these two missions. I score three for this one, two for this one. Because you see, uh, it's Reclaim Bordeaux and Maine, uh, Normandy and Co. Norm Bordeaux, Maine, Normandy and Co. Then all four. So we gain five. And we're going to gain a claim in Languedoc and draw any two action cards and keep one. So a claim in Languedoc, which I totally know what that is. Yeah, it's down here. And any two action cards. I don't know. We, I feel like we definitely need some diplomatic advisors here, huh, guys? Uh, we got some cheap ones, so that's not the best result. Uh, I don't like getting unrested by that AI, so we're going to keep... So basically, there's a lot of like covert actions. Like when they add unrest... In a spy action, you can counter that with a counter espionage card, which can be handy. Um, so that's it. That's the end of the round. Um, for the bots, we do do some cleanup. Um, we'll, we're playing on a, a hard difficulty mode, so they actually gain four, they gain nine bot power here. So now you see that really the first round is kind of where the bots are lowest in power. They you know, one more than their starting nine here. I think England is actually going to be, yeah, England is actually only starting at 10. They had a rough round, very expensive round. Austria, Austria's going to gain quite a bit though. So they have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Um, but they gain one extra bot power. They gain a diplomatic power because they're the people curator controller. So they gain 10. And they gain an extra cube for being, oh, the Imperial Emperor. So they gain 11. They're doing pretty good. So as the French here, you know, we've dealt a big blow to the English, but the Austrians are, they're pretty strong. They've they got to be our, our primary focus going forward. Uh, or at least they would be. Uh, and then as the boss, you would also kind of fix up their decks here. Um, you never reshuffle in their focus cards. <clears throat> so we're going to take out any focus cards that they played. Those guys are on until we kind of reshuffle their whole deck if we get to that the event card always goes back in and then the rest we will shuffle back in half rounded up so that one's gone events always go back in put these guys up Boop. and there's their deck for the next round we'll do the same thing over here so you can see it well, i play two cards we really kind of messed english up this round uh so one of those gets removed we don't know which one Castilians, same. Because they kind of did an expensive diplomacy and then they were kind of dealing with their war for the rest of it. Um, so it'll be interesting to see if that was the military one or the diplomatic one. Um, oh, and we actually missed this. Player would have clocked this, but we actually did get our Conquer Enemy Lands one. Because we successfully, we, we sieged these three actually on the same round, so we would have gotten our three prestige. Oh, so we actually see now, now we're behind Austria because we got that one second. And we actually get another five ducats. Dude, we're so rich. Crazy rich. 30, uh, 37 ducats at the end of the first round. That is bonkers. That is bonkers, guys. Um, and yeah, there you have it. That's This is kind of a sample of uh, round one of playing this scenario with three bots. Um, you know, we kind of went out there we were playing pretty aggressively it definitely paid off for us um this isn't the hardest difficulty mode the difficulty mode is essentially control how much bot power they get per round um yeah but i think going forward we would kind of have to worry about austria getting a little too powerful they didn't accomplish a ton this round um you know aragon as well didn't accomplish a ton or castile didn't accomplish a ton they didn't get the Union. So at the start of the next round, we would deal out three, five more events, three, three of them up. We would go through card draw, paying for our new cards. We would probably keep all, all, all three of them, paying the six, because we're rich. And then we have three evaluate. We, you know, do we want to go exploring? Do we want to start maybe trying to expand diplomatically into northern Italy? Kind of, you know, get a little, get a little close to Austria here, maybe pull some shenanigans. But as you see, there's there's a ton of options. I could do so much. 
Um, you know, this is a scenario where we're playing against three bots in as France. Uh, I've played one where I made a makeshift Byzantium against a, a bot uh, Ottomans with some other bots nearby, and that's a completely different game, as I'm sure you can imagine. You're very small, so you have to really rely on your allies. Um, you know, going in on these all-in, loan up and get some mercenary strategies. It's very similar to the board game, or you know, if you're playing as you know, you're up here in Sweden, and you got a bot Denmark and a bot Novgorod, Muscovy. It's just completely different. So you can definitely just see how, depending on who you play as, what bots you put in, what if you're starting in 1444, 1618, um, you know, what ideas come up, what milestones come up, what order the events come up in. It, it, it's so variable in terms of what can happen. And I know it kind of did seem. It definitely did seem like I kind of steamrolled the bot here. Um, that is not my experience. Uh, generally, this has been the best uh, I think I've ever done against a bot. Just trying to go up full aggro like this before. Uh, generally, it doesn't go so well. Generally, the bot is pretty good at fighting in a direct confrontation. Um, although, France, I definitely would say, has the upper hand at the start of the game. Um, <clears throat> yeah, this is a great round one for me. But, you know. Yeah, no, I think um, this is kind of giving you a good overview of how the bots work. They kind of they cycle through these events. Uh, they cycle through these uh, bot deck, rather. They consult their charts, which are customized for each faction. If we did get to H2, then we would kind of rebuild their deck there on the left. Take out, like, you know, card number five. Put six in instead, for instance. You'll see that, you know, the cards have a... Uh, let me flip that one. So you have a, a seven at the bottom, so that's a card number seven. Where they change, they adapt to the age. Um, you know, England is going to be a tough spot here. They might just abandon the new... They might abandon the old world at this point. Maybe vassalize Portugal on their next turn. Maybe pick up quests for the new world. Go explore the new world. Get victory points out there. Uh, you really don't know. And that's one of the great things about the bots. They can kind of surprise you. Catch you unaware. You know, who knows? What if... You know, what if what if I wasn't able to end this war? So I thought, well, I have so much money that I can go. I can keep going with this war. I can keep. I can take these areas if I hadn't gotten them from England next round. But then, you know, maybe Castile. They come in on me. Uh, you know, and then uh, I'm still excommunicated. So maybe that could cause problem. You know, that would have given them a cautious value against me. So they would they would have been able to come in against me with that. Um, yeah, it could just go so many ways. Um, so a lot of fun. I uh, hope you've enjoyed this demonstration. I uh, hope it's gotten you excited to, to kind of just play this even by yourself against boss. I can tell you it's a ton of fun. Uh, this, I was going pretty slow because I was walking through everything. Um, going over to the tablets when, you know, it's much faster to do that by yourself. Explaining, going walking through the charts. Um, I did the whole spiel at the start with explaining how the boss works. It does go a lot faster. I can generally do... I could have done, I think, this whole round by myself without kind of walking talking through it in about 20 to 30 minutes um i think i've played quite a few games now well i've been playing for over a year now but i think i, I can do a, a round i could have done that around in 20 to 30 minutes so you can see how you know if i was doing an eight round game the, the latter rounds will be a bit longer but you can really kind of get a nice game in against some bots in this scenario in you know three three hours or so three four hours if my math is accurate there? Yeah. Um, this is a great game session length. Uh, you can bust it, you can make it a lot longer. You can do, you know, you can do four ages, the whole thing with six bots, add in some other mechanics like dynamic NPRs, you know, which are these, these kind of symbols that come out um, to represent growing natural powers. Actually, one thing we did forget to do is at the end of a round, um, the kind of events, the symbols down here on the untaken events still go through. So we do another loss at sea. Um, yeah, the dynamic NPRs of green and orange would expand a little bit. So I think there is a card, for instance, that makes Portugal a dynamic NPR. They kind of colonize based on a certain event. It could be that the green emerges down here and then they start colonizing. So that kind of dynamically changes whether or not Portugal is really strong. 
There is an orange one later on. We chose not to have, this scenario doesn't have one starting out, but eventually you'll notice that we've got some Netherlands symbols back here. So eventually we'll see the, the, the Dutch rise up as the orange symbol. Um, they'll take the position here. So if, you know, maybe we're doing a later start with the Dutch right on the board, so that orange one would cause them to expand. Uh, and you know, as you can see, there's just so much you can do. You can mix in bots. You're gonna have bots really for. Um, there's a ton. There's gonna be a ton of bots. I can actually just show you at the bottom here. All the bots are gonna have special rules for them, special flowcharts and compositions. Uh, there's all the ones we have shown here. France also has one. Massivi has one at the moment done. Uh, all of these are getting their own ones. So that's quite a few here. You can see. Um, but, you know, if you really, really want to, if you want to do some weird niche campaign where you're like, I want to play as, you know, Ulm, which there's actually a scenario of playing as Ulm, so that's not that outlandish, but you're like, I want to have a bot Frankfurt, a bot Nuremberg, Magdeburg, you just do like this weird, like, HRE bot rumble dungeon, you can kind of, you can really throw together one of these, um, like a, a basic one that will suffice quite quickly, and the system can adapt. Um, you just need to make a little flowchart for their neighbors and kind of just use your, you know, just think about what, what, what would go in here. Would, would the Platinum have some naval actions? Uh, probably not. Maybe like one on the off chance that they expand up into Flanders, but, you know. Yeah, so I hope, uh, you know, um, if you have any questions or if you want to see more, swing by the European Universal Spice Power Discord. Um, there's a bunch going on there every day. Um, it's a great community. Uh, I've been Patrick. Hope you've enjoyed this. Um, yeah. Thank you.